three, two, one. And good morning, everybody. Welcome to the June 9th meeting of the Infrastructure and Economic Development Committee. And for those watching from home, the voting members of this committee are myself, Councillor Thiessen, Mayor Given, and Councillor Clayton. The rest get to contribute to conversation, but they don't get to make motions or vote. So if you're watching from home and you're wondering what's going on, that might explain something that you're seeing. Anyways, we will start with item 1.1, and that is Director's Service Area Update. And I'll hand it over to Director Glavin. Thank you, Chair Bretzi. We'll start off with economic development. Uh, last week, members of a number of uh, regional urban municipalities participated in a session uh, for the regional strategy that is being coordinated by Sexsmith. Uh, they looked at uh, different topics related to re regional economic development. And this afternoon, the group will meet again to discuss the role that entrepreneurship plays in growth and how the region can further support that. For the Economic Development Advisory Committee, uh, they're going to meet this week to go over terms of reference to create a subcommittee um, that will look at developing recommendations for the economic recovery and they'll bring back a report to committee uh, in response to the previous motion with how to administer the economic recovery fund. Uh, through the GPREP Business Ambassador Program, uh, to date the business ambassadors have completed 564 site visits to businesses. Uh, and uh, continue to support businesses that are preparing to relaunch as part of phase two. In energy and environment, the tender for the uh, combined heat and power unit for East Link Center will close on June 17th, and ADCO will provide a recommendation of the best unit to us by June 22nd. In engineering, uh, this week we've posted tenders for the sidewalk rehab phase two, uh, our sidewalk rehab engineering for 2021, so that's getting ready for uh, next year's program. Uh, the spillway assessment and study RFP, so that's down at the reservoir in Muskegee Park. Uh, and downtown rehab phase four, uh, tender notice of intent. So that is uh, phase four that we've uh, in the capital plan for next year. The notice of intent is uh, just saying that we intend to post the actual tender uh, and I believe we're aiming for June 18th of this month to post that tender. For the uh, tenders awarded, we've awarded the bridge repair and maintenance RFP, the geometric upgrades and traffic signals up or 108th Avenue and 96th Street, uh, retaining wall replacement in Pinnacle, uh, traffic signal inspection program for this year and next year, the PUL drainage repair in uh, Ivy Lake, uh, 132nd Ave uh, ditch regrading, uh, our storm flushing and inspection program, as well as our supply of traffic signal equipment tenders. Uh, we currently have a number of projects, uh, a few of the notable ones. We've just uh, completed the road rehab in College Park. Uh, we've started on 98th Street and, or should be 98th. Yeah, there's air there in West Point Drive. Uh, trail rehab in College Park, as well as trail rehab in Crystal Lake Estates. And Aquaterra started a trunk extension on 84th Avenue. And Alberta Transportation has started some road rehab work up on uh, Highway 670 or 132nd Avenue. Uh, in inspection services, uh, this week they will complete final inspections on the new hospital. So that should pave the way for that to be turned over to AHS shortly. In transportation, uh, we've completed our first round of longitudinal line paintings throughout the city. So those are all your solid lines or passing lines. Uh, and we've started work on the lateral lines, so all the crosswalks and stop bars uh, around the city. Uh, we've completed our gravel haul program in the rural service area. So we've delivered and placed over 9,000 tons of gravel. Our dust control program is currently underway and the residential program for sweeping should start by the 20, or should be completed, sorry, by the 26th of June. In parks, uh, notable is that we picked up over 24 metric tons of garbage in the month of May, and 20% of that total was on the west portion of Highway 43 uh, over by the airport. And uh, that's my report. Thank you. Is there anybody that had any questions for Director Glavin? 
I know, I know one I've had, I've, I've had a lot of compliments from, talk about parks, I've had a lot of compliments from the community about uh, public utility lots behind people's houses being mowed sooner and more frequently than they, than they've seen in past years. And that was kind of a pleasant surprise for a lot of residents. And I didn't, and it was kind of a surprise to me, not one that I'm excited about. I'm just curious, have we changed our service standard there or what's happening? Is that just people just have to be noticing it this year? What's going on with that? Do you know? Yeah, thanks Chair Bressy. There's uh, no change in service standard this year. They may have more people noticing it or we may have just simply gotten to those areas sooner than we may have in past years, but no, no directed standard change. Great. Well, just so you know, I've had lots of compliments from people in different neighborhoods. It has just been one neighborhood complimenting me, so it's been a good compliment to take. Um, any other questions for Director Lavin? Great. Well, then moving on to item 1.2, we've got Mr. Hutchinson. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and Councillors. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to present this morning. This uh, report relates to the pedestrian safety at the intersection of 110th Avenue and 102nd uh, Street. I will just uh, share my screen with you, which is that one, I believe. So, um, <clears throat> so administration are recommending that uh, the committee receive this report for information. Uh, as you may recall, uh, the uh, during the council meeting of the 10th of February, council passed a motion directing administration to investigate pedestrian safety at um, uh, this location. Uh, a report was presented on the 12th of May. Um, uh, subsequent to the presentation of this report, uh, committee directed administration to go back and uh, talk to the Avondale School and also the parent council group. Um, uh, you may recall from the presentation on the 12th of May that uh, the engineering investigation of the uh, intersection uh, said that the crosswalk uh, infrastructure was appropriate for the type of road, crossing distance, the speed of traffic. Um, it conformed with national standards. Um, it was also of a higher um, uh, quality than uh, exists uh, at uh, many other crosswalks within the city. However, one of the uh, areas of concern that was uh, noted by engineering was that there was um, uh, a sightline issue uh, for pedestrians on the west side of the crosswalk uh, when looking south uh, towards northbound traffic. Uh, the sightline was momentarily uh, uh, obstructed by the planter that's in the, uh, the middle of the road. Uh, as directed by um, uh, committee, uh, I discussed uh, these concerns with the um, uh, Ms. Jay Leclerc, who's the uh, um, assistant uh, principal at uh, Avondale School. She also represents the uh, parent council group. And uh, one of the things during our uh, discussion of possible mitigation strategies was um, I, I recommended that we install an advance warning sign on the south side of the planter to um, raise driver awareness that they are approaching a crossing. Uh, this uh, sign was installed uh, the following week on the 21st of May. Um, Ms. Jay Leclerc uh, seemed satisfied with that response and uh, no further action was necessary. Um, so essentially that really wraps up my report. Um, administration have um, reached out to the parent group and uh, discussed the matter with the school. Um, and, and they seem satisfied with the, uh, the approach that we took, the detailed investigation in the first instance, and, uh, and also that um, uh, what was done in, in the more recent uh, discussion. So any further questions? Great, Th thank you for the report. I'll, um, I'll also add that shortly after Mr. Hutchison talked to the parent group, they reached out to me and they said that they were happy with the resolution to me, they appreciated seeing the safety data and having their mind put at ease with that. And they appreciated the conversation with Mr. Hutchison and they appreciated the sign. So thought I'd add that context too. So thank you, Mr. Hutchison for the time you gave them. Uh, is there anybody that's got any questions or comments they'd like to make? Uh, Councilor Thiessen. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks Chair Bressy. Uh, no, pretty much. I'm just going to repeat close to what you said. Uh, uh, I also heard back from Jay and uh, she's very happy with uh, with the response and the level of communication. I just want to thank Robin and his team for uh, taking that extra step, uh, even even as directed. 
uh, and for finding a simple and cost-effective uh, solution that uh, sort of addresses the concerns of the parent group and of the school. So thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate this report coming through. Thank you. Okay. Mayor Gibbon. Yeah, uh, if there wasn't anything else, I'd just move that we receive the report for information. Great. Uh, any uh, any further discussion? In that case, all in favor of the motion to receive for information? Um, <laughs> and then, so that motion carries. And then we will move on to item 1.3, and that's Ms. Arsenault. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Chair Ressi. Um, I am here this morning to present our amendments to our building bylaw. Uh, we have been working with our building bylaw since 2015. And over this time, we've identified a few minor changes that needed to be updated. Uh, these started with clarifying and adding a couple of definitions, some minor grammar corrections, refining application requirements. There was a need to add a private sewage treatment system permit holder section. We provided clarity for building permit preliminaries and application requirements, as well as added a clause to allow us to charge for a VLC and a clause to allow us to transfer a permit. These amendments were circulated to the Canadian Home Builders Association and the Construction Association with no concerns received. We also do not foresee any budget or financial implications with these, and therefore administration is recommending committee to recommend council give three readings to the bylaw C1328B as an amendment to the building bylaw. Great. Thank you for your report. Are there any questions? Um, I know I had I had one question, and it was in regards to duplexes. I'm just noticing that we've got a different definition for duplex in this bylaw than we do in our land use bylaw. I'm just wondering if there's a reason for that. Uh, yes, thank you. So I, I did, um, I had recently chatted with um, a couple of people on that factor. Uh, so our main, our main change for taking it or changing it from what it was in our previous or I guess our current bylaw, it was reading and getting tied into the ownership of utilities and what's required in order for it to be considered a duplex. So when we made our change, we were strictly just looking to take out anything that uh, related to the ownership of utilities, just because that is one of the things that we've come across in recent, uh, recent times. So we were looking at it to divide it up or to clarify that definition to simply speak to a duplex is a dwelling unit divided in a up down, uh, in a vertical direction versus, I think the land use bylaw you're referencing also speaks to a front back is a duplex. Yeah, so um, yeah, those, those terms could align better for sure. The main thing, I guess what, what we had overlooked initially is just the fact that uh, the back to front duplex, we, we haven't done it, we haven't issued it. It's not, it's not something common, so we just didn't address it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Clayton. Oh, sorry, Councillor Clayton, you're muted. Sorry, I unclicked it, but it didn't go. Uh, thanks, Chair Bressy. I just wanted to note that I appreciate uh, the changes being highlighted in, in a different color. Uh, although in the overall report, it identifies the changes, but it's nice to see them so you can clearly find them uh, where, you know, where the, when it's simply just a wording change, it's nice to see where it's highlighted, so I appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Thanks, Chair Brosey. Yeah, I like these, these simple amendments, and uh, just saying that, I'm going to offer up a motion if uh, there are no, it's no further discussion. Yeah, I think go ahead and make a motion, please. All right, thanks. Uh, I would move that committee recommend council give three readings to bylaw C-1328B, being an amendment to the building bylaw. Great. And any discussion or debate on that? In that case, all in favor? And that motion carries. Great. Thank you, Ms. Arsenal. And then moving on to item 2.1, we have got a letter from 
Councilor Bresci, you've muted yourself. Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> um, so moving on to item 2.1, we've got a letter from the town of Edson asking if we'd like to contribute some seed funding to looking at the plan for an electric vehicle charging network. And so I'm going to assume that committee had a chance to read the letter. So I'm wondering if there's any discussion or motions that committee would like to co make coming out of this. Councilor Thiessen. And then Mayor Gibbon, if he wants to after. Um, yeah, I guess uh, my, I, I'm, I'm totally in line with this. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I wonder though if other municipalities along that uh, corridor to Edmonton have been contacted by the mayor of Edmonton and maybe Mayor Gibbon has something more to add to that. But I know that I've had some discussion with uh, councillors out of Valley View and I know there was discussion at the last day you may about, uh, you know, not being able to take your electric vehicle up to Edmonton without a charge and maybe getting on board with uh, the council of White Court to, to get there. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be in full support, but I think in order for this to work, we need to have that uh, northern pipeline of EV charging stations. Uh, and Grand Prairie is one stop, but uh, to have multiple partners along the road to Edmonton would be would be huge and beneficial. Um, and and I guess also on the way to Edson, like through Grand Cache and Hinton and all that. So I'm not sure, uh, Bill, if you have anything to add to that, but uh, I'm, I'm, I was actually really curious seeing if uh, anyone else had been contacted in, in regards to this, or if it was just us as, as a supportive partner. And then Mayor yeah. Given. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the document, and, and it is, could easily miss, because it's pretty small font size, uh, but they copy, uh, they identify who they also copied, uh, which does include Town of White Court, Woodland County, um, Town of Fox Creek, uh, the MD of Greenview, which of course would be both Grand Cash now, um, and obviously would have some influence around uh, the Valley View area. Um, and so it is a pretty extensive list uh, that that would make a good uh, good route by by sort of by the look of it. I had a question though for administration: um, if uh, our environmental services uh, department had had a chance to have a look at this, um, and whether or not we'd be able to identify a location, because my memory is that. Uh, at least a part of our downtown enhancement program was was putting in place the infrastructure that would allow for vehicle charging stations. I'm, I'm just kind of curious about our ability to participate on the infrastructure, if anything came of this, and whether or not our uh, environmental services department had an opinion about this request. Okay, so, Director Glavin, I'll let you answer that question. I see Council Clayton wants to get in after. Yeah, thanks, Chair Clayton. Uh, so, we have considered uh, some locations in the past, including downtown. Uh, I know that we were looking to have uh, infrastructure installed as part of phase four, uh, but I, uh, so that's coming up for next year. Uh, we've also considered Center 2000 as potentially a good location with the tourism component. Um, so we have given some consideration to where we might put these uh, and, our, our, and we do have uh, both economic development and environment. We're familiar with uh, this initiative with Edson. Councilor Clayton. Thanks, Chair Bressy. Um, I know that um, in the private sector, uh, hotels, many hotels seem to have them, not a lot in Grand Prairie, but in other markets. I do know, though, the private sector has an opportunity to access dollars through the federal government to for the installation of these. Um, some of the vehicle manufacturers that make electric vehicles also um, are willing to help subsidize this um, uh, in, in the private sector. Um, so, uh, if council's appetite is to, you know, get more information or follow through on this initiative, um, I would highly recommend that we check to see what funding sources there are out there besides our own dollars. Thanks. Uh, so, I'll do Councillor Minhas, Councillor Plotz, and Mayor Gibbon. Thank you, little Brassi. Uh, I saw this putting on the uh, Petro Pass few few places. I was gone to BC. I think some last uh, little while ago. And uh, th those things, when you put it in, they charge for hourly or depend on how many uh, you put the plugged in and charge the stated price automatically with the computer. I don't know anybody done in, I don't see in the Grand Prairie area, but I see in the highway, and uh, they have been put it in the Petrobras units. So I don't know if that's a government subsidy or private doing it. And same thing, like Jesse said, the hotels, and they, some, I see that, that. I think it's a Calgary or some place I saw in the hotel too. Councillor Platt. 
thanks, Jim Rusty. I guess for me, kind of similar to Councilor Clayton's concerns, I think this is a great initiative and I'd love the city to be a part of it. I'm just not sure if this is our lane that we need to be picking. I, I think if this is going to be sustainable for the community long term, I think this is something industry is going to have to step up to. So I, I'd be curious to how we're going to work with our industry partners. Um, these charging stations, you don't just park your car and charge it right away. So, I mean, you know, it's nice to, to identify a few locations, but you know, the charges on these are quite long and it can come with a cost. So, I guess for me, I think this is something that the industry should be doing. I don't think this is something the city should be getting way into at all. I don't mind us looking into it and try to advocate and help with the industry. Um, but this is going to come with a cost to the city at some point, and I just don't think this is something we should get involved with personally. I think this is something we should be trying to work with the industry to figure out how they can make this happen. This will be part of our uh, economy moving forward and help people use their vehicles with electric instead of gas moving forward. Uh, Mayor Given, then. Yeah. So, so a uh, couple things. Um, in the letter, they specifically reference that, uh, and it is a bit contradictory, but in the letter, they specifically reference that they would foresee the project being uh, funded by federal grants, uh, and they mentioned a federal grant deadline. So the, the ask here is, are we interested in participating in an application to the federal government? Um, so I'm not quite sure what the, the, the seed funding of $30,000 would go towards, um, but that could be something that we could say, hey, we're interested in participating in, in a federal grant application um I, you know i don't know what would take thirty thousand dollars you know to, to do that and maybe we could provide some other different kind of support or something but we may want to answer sort of saying um we're interested in participating tell us more about the costs um and you know and i would i'd be interested in following up at that level the other thing too to know is the grand prairie does have vehicle charging stations um the private sector is providing them pv mart has one um, might not have been the top of mind for everybody but you can go to pv mart or you can go to the Grand Prairie Airport. There's at least two that I know of um, in the city. Uh, I'm not sure if there are others, there may be, but it is one of those ones where the private sector will fill some of that gap. Um, but it's probably worthwhile to, for us to participate in this in terms of tourism and being a, demonstrating that we are an important part of any trip to the north must come through Grand Prairie. Like, I think we should always be saying that uh, and even just our participation in initiatives like that, like this with Faisal. Councilor Thiessen. Yeah, actually, yeah, thanks, Chair Bresky. I was going to point out the same thing that the letter was saying uh, to, we were going to try to tap into a federal grant. I think that $30,000 is maybe maybe the consulting fees, it says, to support the, the documentation, the, the filing of the grant. Um, and so depending on how many partners, it, it might be a very minimal cost. Like if everybody on this list uh, signs up for it, uh, it may be five, $600. I guess the only question uh, that at least we answered, and I don't think we have the answer to it right now, is uh, how much of the grant is, is are they applying for and uh and with all of these with all these these partner municipalities will that go very far uh, i do agree with councillors clayton and palat that uh private industry has a role to play in it and i do know that they're saying it bill like stole my thunder with the pv march but i was like PV mark. um but uh, i think this is becoming more and more common and more of these are coming online and i think uh uh i think private is is definitely leading the way and i think uh if city and municipalities can get on board we might see a quick transition over to to more electric vehicles on our road here in the future so uh, with all that being said I'd be more than prepared to uh, I guess we're, we're not we're looking for action here so not to receive for information but to to endorse our support to endorse the, the letter for the town of Edson and become a, a partner I guess yeah so I'm just, we're, I'm just wondering ahead, about that so so there's a there's an ask for contributing to seed funding, and it's kind of an awkward ask because they're saying the total cost is thirty thousand, but they're not making a specific ask for us. But it's I think there's two elements to this. There's one saying, yeah, we'll put our name behind this, and we'll maybe put and we'll provide information. But there's also the we'll contribute some cash to that. And I think for me, it's a very easy for yes, we'll put our name behind this, but I don't really know how to deal with the cash component of this. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for throwing that in there, Chair Bressy. I was wondering the same thing because, uh, I, I don't know, quick math, uh, this could be something as low as $700 for the city of Grand Prairie or it could be as high as $15,000 depending if everybody says no, right? So I guess uh, that bit of clarity. And I, I kind of look to the mayor as uh, uh, what kind of direction he would look. I, I would say probably a letter of support for sure uh, uh, to endorse the project um, and then to follow up with the mayor of Edson uh, to see what other partners are involved, 
uh, and then report back to council. I, I don't know if that's appropriate, but. Maybe I saw our city manager hoping to get in, so maybe I'll let him see if he's got any advice for us before I move on to the rest of the committee members. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a suggestion could be that council authorizes um, a maximum amount for contribution, could be you know $5,000 or uh, whatever you feel uh, uh, comfortable, uh, giving administration authorization to follow up with uh, Mayor Sahara, get more information about the overall project, um, provide support, and then up to X number of dollars. Uh, again, if only we have two partners, so we have to put 15,000, maybe that's, that's a no, if the amount is less, but uh, that would be the general uh, approach if you're okay with that. Thank you. So, and then, sorry, for the city manager, if, if council did do that, would you rather us identify a funding source for that or let you guys figure out the funding source? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the amounts we're talking, um, we, we can identify the fund, the funding source. No, no problem. It's relatively uh, a small amount. Okay. Uh, Councilor Clayton, are you hoping to get in? Thanks, Chair Bressy. Um, yeah, that was sort of going to be my uh, comments. I can't support the motion as it is. However, I think that there's an opportunity here for us um, to support this up to, um, you know, even if 10 of the approximately 15, 20 that are there it would be $3,000. So if we wanted to identify an amount, I would be comfortable $3,000. And saying that, I think that there is potential to fund this out of the uh, economic recovery initiative uh, that's been set aside uh, for, um, to, for recovery after COVID. And, and the reason being because tourism is a huge part of economic development. And uh, this seems like it could be potentially a good tourism driver. The more potential people coming through our community, uh, the more maps we get on because all of a sudden we're in a charging network. The more times our, our name shows up, whatever sort of sector it may be, including electric vehicles, the better. So um, for, you know, for an amount that I think of it could be potentially $3,000, this makes sense. Um, so I can't support the motion it is. However, I would be um, supportive of something uh, similar to the CAO mentioned. Thank you. And then maybe I'll go to Mayor Given and I'll come back to Council Thiessen and I, I don't, I'm not quite clear on what the motion was and I, and if there was a motion on the floor, I'd definitely welcome. No, no, there was no motion. Yeah, yeah, there's okay. no motion. Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, I, I was just going to say, I, I don't think there was a motion. Um, I am happy with sort of the discussion, would be happy to support a motion. I, I don't know that we need to be up at $3,000. Um, I would be completely comfortable with 1000 Um I have a feeling that that this might not cost as much as, as as it's identified. I'd be surprised if an application for a federal grant cost thirty thousand dollars to develop. Um, so uh, you know, um, I'd be happy with saying yes, we're in, and we're in with a little bit of cash. Um, I would, and hopefully, we didn't need to use any of that. Um, so if somebody was going to make a motion, um, you know, direct administration contact with our support and a certain dollar amount. I would be happy to support that. Great. Well, I see Director Glavin tried to tried to get in, so I'll let him get in, and then maybe I'll ask committee, hey, would somebody make a motion, whatever that motion is, after Director Glavin's been able to chime in? Yeah, thanks, Chair Bretzi. I received some information that the grant is up to 50%, so there would be a, a need for a contribution. Is, is anybody willing to make a motion? Yeah. Mayor Given. Sure. I'd move the kidding. Um, I'd move the committee recommend council uh, endorse the um, Northwest Alberta Electric Vehicle Charging Network uh, request from the town of Edson, and provide up to a thousand dollars for the city of Grand Prairie to participate in the program. Um, any conversation on that motion? In that case, all in favor. And that motion carries. Uh, and then Councilor Clayton. Thanks, Chair Bressy. Um, can we uh, have a request that administration follows up with committee to see, uh, you know, how this goes? I would, uh, if you get not quite enough money, and for this to go ahead, I'm, you know, maybe council or committee rather has a appetite to go to two thousand dollars or three thousand dollars. So I just ask that. Uh, uh, as we hear more about this, we get updated at committee again. Thanks. Great. Yeah, no, I think that's a good request. I know for me, I'm happy to support a thousand because of the vague ask right now, but I could quite 
easily maybe be persuaded to support more if I had more information about why that was needed, where that had to go. So I appreciate that request. Uh, any other business arising from this? Great. Well, then we're going to move on to item 3.1, business licensing. And I see my name's next to it, but I believe it was actually Councillor Pilat who asked to have this added to the agenda. So I'll hand this over to Councillor Pilat. Uh, thanks, Chair Bressy. Um, this just came up in a conversation we're having with our Economic Development Committee. Uh, one of the things we're talking about is trying to, as we're working with businesses moving forward, trying to compile information from them. It'd be actually nice to have this to start rolling out and launching later this year. Um, and I just, I guess I wanted to try to have a conversation with him back and hoping that it could be maybe brought back as an agenda item so we can discuss it again. No administration had presented this to us at one point. Um, I guess for me, I think there's a good opportunity for us to look at relaunching this or possibly launching this this fall um, and putting other criteria around it that we could actually get information. Uh, part of the things we're hoping through through Economic Development Chamber is it would be nice to have an ability to understand um, our businesses, to be honest, how many employees they have, what kind of struggles they're having. There's a series of bouquet of questions that we could be asking. We need a mechanism to do that though. And so uh, I guess for me, business licensing, I think is something that could, could achieve this. I'm not saying it needs to be a fee attached to it. I'm not, I'm not going there on this. I just think we need to find a, a mechanism of being able to understand uh, some, some good lead questions that we could be asking our business communities in different segments. Um, so I just wanted to get this today as a conversation to hopefully have, see if there's any appetite in there, and if I could nudge somebody on this committee, because I can't make a motion to ask if this comes back, um, so we can have another conversation about this, so I can hopefully get this to back to the Economic Development Committee, the advisory side, but to see what we can look like with us and start shaping it. Okay, so I see Councillor Clayton wants to chime in, but before I do that, maybe I'll ask Director Glavin, uh, whatever you want to share, we're open to hearing, but also something I'd love to know is just, if administration receives no input from committee or council, no further direction than whatever you've got on your table right now, when would this, when would we be touching this next? Yeah, thanks Chair Brassi. Uh, we had initially planned to start our engagement on the new business licensing bylaw in March and then put the engagement on hold due to COVID as we didn't want to try and ram something through when we couldn't have any open houses or it was a little more difficult to do engagement. Uh, given that, you know, we don't have a lot of certainty when larger groups indoors will be allowed, although we're obviously inching towards that, uh, we're working on some sort of uh, model to do engagement that we do it um, via Zoom or some similar platform um, to get some of that feedback so that we can start moving the ball forward on business licensing again. So I think that we are going to be probably hitting Councillor Palat's timeline of this fall. Uh, to bring it to council is is our current intent. Um, council Clayton, I can't see any more, but if you're still there, you're welcome to chime in or ask a question. Thanks, Chair Bressy. Um, yeah, I, uh, that that answer is great. I think um, the fall is a good time, and I, I think this is a good initiative. Um, business owners will, um, as much as a lot of people don't like regulation and licensing, I think they'll respect and value the opportunity that this brings as what we've just gone through in the last the past few months. So, um, you know, I, I think that this would be a good initiative. Um, however, I think that, you know, as uh, uh, Director Glavin mentioned, the fall is probably a realistic time frame. So thank you. Mayor Given. Yeah, I was just gonna uh, ask uh, Director Glavin if, um, well, would it be useful if committees got this on our outstanding items list, uh, you know, and, and with a date so that we could, number one, speak to the business community and the Economic Development Advisory Committee and, and let them know that, hey, it is actually on council's agenda and we're expecting it back by such such date. Um, we all know and I think understand with our outstanding items list that if dates have to change, then, then that's possible if there's some extenuating circumstance, but at least it gets it so that it's tracked and council is aware of sort of progress on it. Um, if we were to do that by a motion, Director Glad, what would you recommend as an appropriate date when you say sort of fall of this year? Uh, I would say the end of September would be um, not unreasonable as a placeholder date. Okay. Okay. So if that's the case, um, I'd be happy to make a motion to direct uh, administration. So I'm going to say direct administration, bring back a uh, report on business licensing by October 1st of 2020, period. 
Um, I think the expectation there, I would probably all understand the expectation. Administration is already doing this work. Uh, this is to put a placeholder so we can track that and we have a sort of a uh, built-in time where we'll automatically check in and see how that's going. Administration has a target to work towards. Uh, my hope would be that by that time they would be bringing forward recommendations to change the business licensing bylaw in that process um, and that engagement would have happened. Councillor Clayton and then Councillor Plott. Thanks, Director, or sorry, Chair uh, Rusty. A question for Director Glavin. Um, is there any opportunity for this to be um, earlier than a report coming back October 1st? And the reason I ask is um, it may sound like very physically weak of me, but I think that if I was a person that was potentially hired to go knock on doors and answer questions for business applications or or be somebody involved, it'd be much easier to touch a lot more businesses in a time that wasn't winter. So if the hope is, you know, that we're going to go into businesses in, in sort of major sort of retail commercial areas anyways, in particular, I'm thinking um, that it might be nice to sort of do it earlier. So I don't know how the director uh, sort of envisions this, if it is sort of a door-to-door -door thing, is it just truly online or is there, a, has there been any thought put to this as of yet? Yeah, thanks Chair Bressy. Uh, we likely wouldn't be going on a door-to-door -door approach, uh, just the, you know, I think we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 8,000 registered businesses in the cities. So we, we likely wouldn't take that approach. I think what we're discussing is going to all of the associations uh, that would have members represented, whether that being, you know, the chamber, UDI, some of the professional associations that exist. Uh, in one um, part of the engagement, as well as having uh, additional engagement, whether that be in person or online for the general public. So anybody who would not be covered under those uh, associations. We haven't fully uh, fleshed out what the online engagement portion will be here because we believe it needs to be more robust than we would typically have for online engagement if we're not able to have the physical um, portion of the, you know, the more traditional engagement that we would do with an open house or something to that effect. And then Councillor Plott. Uh, thanks, Chair Bressy. I guess I'm just wondering if, um, and then probably what Councillor Clayton was said, if those sooners better, I think this may be with topically what's going on, but I'm one that is doable. I'm just, and, and then finally, the motion is, I'm just wondering if there'd be an opportunity before it came back to committee that it could be vetted by the Economic Development Committee for their comments as well. So that just when October 1 hits, we've actually went through having a mechanism of getting into the economic development committee for them to have their comments on. So when it comes to council, we've already got that just to expedite it a little bit more. If that's something that administration uh, could do without, it doesn't need to be worded in the motion. I just wonder if that could be, uh, could be something that we could expect to have in, uh, pre this coming to committee. So Director Glavin, Glavin, I'll let you address that and then I see Council Clayton wanted to get it in again. Yeah, thanks Chair Bressy. It will, we'll definitely make uh, effort to get this done before the end of September or October 1st. Uh, there's just some uncertainty in there on how this online engagement will go. Uh, so, you know, had we went with our initial timeline, uh, we intended to have the engagement done in March and April, present a draft business license bylaw to committee uh, this spring. So it would have already been here with the uh, license, with the bylaw going to council this summer with an implementation date of September 1st. Now we've lost two, three months just given COVID. So moving that back, I, I think we can still um, get this implemented before the end of the year, but we'll definitely uh, make every effort to get it first and we can bring it to committee in a draft form uh, sooner. So I, I think if we're looking at October-ish for council, uh, adoption, that's probably what we're likely looking at. Uh, Council Clayton, then Mayor Gibbon. Thanks, uh, Chair Bressy. Um, to Councilor Plot's comments, I, I appreciate your intent there with it going back to economic development. However, I think this is a committee level discussion uh, as it's a bylaw and a procedure. The information that's obtained out of it will be valuable to economic development, but I don't see it as uh, an economic development committee driven initiative. Uh, this to me is more as because it's, um, you know, gonna have bylaws and 
very specific procedures. Um, I think that coming back to committee um, is, is where it should go. Thanks. And then Mayor Gibbon. Uh, so I, I think it's a little bit of both. <laughs> um, if I can sort of walk the line between Councilors Plot and Clayton. I think uh, administration, it wouldn't be a surprise to me if administration took this through the Economic Development Advisory Committee as a part of the public consultation process. Um, there, you know, probably a number of those business owners will be consulted as individual business owners um, or have the opportunity. And we, it wouldn't be unreasonable for us to have this body that we expect to give us economic development advice, give us an opinion, so that when we sit down as council and committee who ultimately have the, the decision-making authority on this, I mean, I don't think Councillor Plot is asking to have the decision-making given over to the Economic Development Advisory Committee. I think they're just a part of the, of the public process. We've got this entity. In the same way, if we were dealing with an issue that was youth focused, we might ask for an opinion of the youth advisory, you know, council or the youth council, um, and then count, and we would see that as part of the council report. I think the same thing here: the economic development advisory committee can have an opinion, and then when we're discussing it as committee and council, we would get a chance to be informed by that opinion. The administration would bring that forward. So I think it's a little bit of both. Um, and if administration, you know, just says, yep, hey, no problem, we can make sure that we check in with the economic, you know, the advisory committee before we bring it to the committee, I would be completely satisfied. Great. Uh, the one thing I'll chime in is just I appreciate it being, pa being pa I was disappointed that we had to pause this, but I appreciate it being paused. And you mentioned because public engagement is difficult, but also just it would have been completely unreasonable to expect business owners to have to navigate and think about one more thing over the last two months when they've been dealing with so much as well. So I really appreciate us being sensitive to the community in terms of pushing this back and not ram, ramming it through. At the same time, I feel the same level of urgency of I, I wish we had it a year ago. So I'm excited that we're having this conversation. Um, is there any further conversation or debate? Great. Well, then we got a motion on the table, which would have the effect of adding this to our outstanding items list and getting a report back by October 1st. So I'll ask, I'll put that to the vote. So all in favor of that motion. And that motion carries. And any business arising on this? Councillor Plot, this is your agenda item. Is Did you get the discussion you thought you needed out of this? Yeah, thanks, Chair Bressie. That was just all it was. I knew that it wasn't lost in the system, just was uh, with, with COVID happening here. I just wanted to make sure that it was still topical. I know we've been talking about it and appreciate uh, Director Glavin saying we can look to having this back for, for that October 1 date and, and us having a conversation. But it was the same thing as your Councillor Bressie. I just wanted to have a conversation and keep going on this. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I appreciate you guys making the motion and, uh, and doing that today. Cool. Well, thanks for bringing it forward. I appreciate it. And then I'll go to Director Glavin with our outstanding items list. Thank you, Chair Bressy. So today we dealt with item 1085 for the pedestrian safety at 110th Avenue and 102nd Street. Uh, we had the addition and then everything else is on track for, or as, uh, as expected. Great. Could I get a motion to accept this? Councillor Thiessen? Uh, uh, so move as amended, Chair Bresson. Great. All in favor? That motion carries. And with that, this meeting adjourns. And I'll be handing it over to Councillor Friesen, who chairs the Community Services Committee. Thanks, Councillor Bresti. Um, sorry, so many tabs open, and I was trying to get rid of a few, and I, of course, the agenda. So good morning. Um, this is the Community Services Committee. We've got Councillors Clayton and Flatt and Mayor Given um, along with myself on this committee. And I believe we have a, de a delegation to begin. Is uh, Jennifer Douglas here from Cards or? Do we have someone from Cards? Yes, I'm here. Oh, there. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> Hi, good to see you. Thank you for uh, coming. So we do have um, your letter of request. Would you like to tell us about your request, please? Sure. Um, so a number or a year or so ago, uh, before the city took over uh, Disabled Transportation Society, um, DTS had made the decision to uh, suspend services for anything outside of medical appointments and jobs and, and school. Um, so as a result of that, we had reached out to a company that we knew that had a couple of 
uh, accessible vehicles, um, 911 industrial, and uh, negotiated a lease with them for one of their vehicles so we could um, support our riders uh, that had transportation barriers to getting to parts. So uh, we were able to negotiate that. Um, however, the vehicle had been sitting in their yard for many years since they bought it at auction and it was not in the best shape. Um, so we did get it roadworthy um, for a time and uh, just recently uh, having taken it in for its next uh, CVIP, um, they had uh, advised 911 Industrial that there was about $20,000 worth of work um, that needed to be done on it in order for it to pass the, the CVIP. And um, with everything that's happened um, in our province and in our world, um, they're just not in a position to make that sort of investment in, in the vehicle. So um, I had reached out to Arlen Miller uh, to see if there could be an opportunity to either resume services um, for the accessible vehicles uh, and our riders back to PARDS, or if there was possibly an opportunity for a um, vehicle that was leaving the fleet to be donated to PARDS. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to open it up to any questions for Jennifer. Oh, uh, Chair Friesen, if I could. Director uh, Miller, yeah. Uh, thanks, Chair Friesen. I can just add a little bit more to it. It was actually uh, Mr. Uh, Steve Madden from Grand Spirit who recommended to Jennifer to contact myself to see if we could uh, provide assistance. So mm -hmm. I have uh, done a little bit of uh, follow up on it and checked with uh, fleet and with transit. And we do have, uh, I think it's three accessible transit buses that are up for uh, replacement in a couple months. And in talking to Jennifer, showing photographs of what we do have available and talking to fleet about the mechanical condition of the buses as well. We do have one that we would recommend if committee and council supports that we could donate it to them. It's uh, when we take it to gov deals, we probably Typically, we get between three and five thousand dollars, so it's not a lot of money. So, uh, administration would recommend, if council supports it, that we do donate a bus to uh, to Pards uh, Therapeutic uh, Society. All right. Thank you, uh, Director Miller. Um, any questions or a motion? Jackie's on. Yeah. Councillor Clayton's trying to get in. So. Oh, uh, Councillor Clayton, I, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. That's I'm right. Oh, uh, yeah. Thanks, Chair Friesen. Um, just a question for administration. Um, I think this is a great initiative and an awesome opportunity for this organization and as well as our, for commu our community. I'm just wondering how it impacts um, our budgeting process. Um, I would assume the selling of old buses is sort of accounted for in our um, operational expenses and, and budgeting throughout the year. So I'm wondering what, you know, have we budgeted for this and this is just going to be a shortcoming of revenue that we are expecting or, or what do you foresee on that? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Chair Friesen. I think it would be a minimal impact. We, um, it's kind of our best guess what, we're, what we receive through gov deals. So uh, it could be 3000 it could be $2,000. So it, it'll be very uh, minimal impact. Thank you. All right, any other uh, further comments, questions, any motions? Chair Friesen. Given? Yes. Yeah, um, so I'd be happy to make a motion. Um, Director Miller, was there a unit number? Like, is it better if we identify that as unit number or? Uh, thanks, Chair Friesen. Uh, right now we do have a unit number. It's uh, TBD037 is what we're recommending. And, uh, and we're Pretty happy with the mechanical condition of it, so that's the one. Uh, it'll be should be available in about two months. Okay, sure. So I'd move uh, committee recommend council approve um, disposal of accessible transit unit TBD 037 um, uh, by uh, donation to uh, PARDS uh, when the unit is removed from service. 
Sorry, uh, Chair Friesen, if I could just clarify, uh, just the unit number is uh, TDP037. Great, thank you. All right, so that uh, motion is on the floor and uh, any, call, uh, any discussion? Then I will call to question then, uh, all in favor of the motion? Great, that passes, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Ms. Douglas, for joining us today. Thank you so much. All right. So we next have the uh, Director Miller with the area update, please. Uh, you're you muted. You're just muted. Sorry. So I'll start with uh, thanks, Chair Friesen. <clears throat> Community Knowledge Campus. Uh, so recently, uh, several city city departments collaborated to assist with uh, the St. Joe's graduation committee. And it was a, a drive-through style uh, high school graduation process and uh, reportedly it went very well and uh, something unique that uh, COVID brought on. But uh, I know the school district was very appreciative of uh, the support provided by uh, East Link staff. And then also uh, East Link finance team has been reviewing and adjusting over 250 booking contracts and these will now be invoiced from February until uh, May of 2020. And we're taking a very fair approach with our clients, uh, being very reasonable due to uh, the situation we're in. With events and entertainment, uh, the Curb exhibit opens at the Art Gallery today, and uh, the collection highlights a partnership between Revolution Place and will be themed around our local experience during the pandemic. And today is, or sorry, yesterday was the, the move from the Dave Barr Community Centre to uh, the Bose Centre for the, the COT program. And I uh, received an update at the end of the day and it went very well. And uh, so we'll monitor the situation. We're hopeful it'll be, uh, I'm sure it'll be run as well as it was at Dave Barr and uh, hopefully even better. And then uh, switching to facilities. So they're continue with continuing with preparations and requirements for the reopening of city facilities. Yesterday, City Hall, the front counter opened. Uh, last week, uh, the museum and a couple other sites also opened. With the outdoor pool, they're doing the dewinterizing uh, process. They finished minor construction deficiencies and are preparing for the opening upon uh, receiving approval from AHS. And then part of the process, we'll be doing testing the water. And I think uh, Mr. Phillips advised that the water will be added this week and uh, beginning that process. And then with fleet, it's business as usual. They're busy maintaining city equipment for use by our staff and uh, we've seen lots of use and, uh, and we appreciate the compliments as well that uh, they're out uh, doing what they should be doing. With sports development, wellness and culture, the Grand Prairie Museum, and I already mentioned this, I guess, uh, the Ernie Radborn Pavilion and uh, HDC reopened to the public on June 2nd. And we're tracking the attendance at those facilities as well. Uh, GP Active launched the first week of June. The social media program is designed to help encourage citizens to be active within their own neighborhood and will provide daily activity suggestions during the duration of the month. With transit, uh, we're busy installing safety cameras on the transit buses and that began last week. And we have driver shields installed on three buses now and what we're doing is testing them on different routes to make sure they work for both the drivers and the passengers and, uh, and then we'll continue with that. And I've mentioned previously, the plan is to have them installed by uh, mid-June and then start uh, charging fees again for transit. And then uh, recently we've had to add an extra bus on our uh, six bus routes that we're operating almost every day due to uh, just with the, the usage on the buses uh, and while we're trying to uh, social distance as well. So, but I think transit's been quick, quick to respond if the, if there's an overcrowding issue, then they uh, quickly get another bus out to the route and to address uh, the demand. And I think that's it, uh, unless there's any questions, uh, Chair Friesen. Any questions for Director Miller? I see that Councillor Clayton has one. Thanks, uh, Chair Friesen. Uh, Director Miller, I'm just curious, on the federal government's announcement uh, last week um, on the 14, billion dollars for the safe restart. There was mention uh, working with municipalities uh, on transit and city program uh, and programming, et cetera, and seniors. So I'm curious if 
there's been any, any early discussions or any early information that's come to administration in regards what the opportunities are for the city on this um, new bucket of money. Thanks, Chair Friesen. Uh, uh, yesterday, Mr. Harvard and I had a brief conversation about it, and uh, he's monitoring it to make sure that uh, when whatever does become available to us, we'll certainly uh, try to access it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other questions? All right, then, a uh, motion to accept the report. Uh, Councillor Clayton? Thank you. So moved. Thank you. Thank you. And um, do we need to no. vote? That's just that, yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, Ms. Ridgway, are you here to talk about Revolution Place design potentials? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. You guys hear me all right? Um, I can't, but I just need to, there we go. Yes, now I can. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members, for the opportunity to present today. Um, administration is recommending committee approve the 544,000 in capital funding that was previously presented by corporate services in May to address the immediate needs at Revolution Place. Motion was put forward directing administration to bring back report on potential of initiating a design build process for renovations at Revolution Place in 2020. We've compiled a list of options for consideration. Um, option one is showing you the breakdown of estimated costs for the previous presented upgrades to Revolution Place. These estimates were compiled by corporate facilities and gives committee a more detailed breakdown of the capital investment. Um, the painting estimate was based on current local pricing. Um, concession breakdown is based on RS mean square foot calculation. And there's a further breakdown from corporate facilities attached. The box office customer service area upgrades was based on the construction of the East Link Center customer service area. And again, these are all estimates um, administration will have firm quotes after initiating the design process through procurement. Option two, so this is the option directed to be brought back to committee. Um, this investment would see the addition of loft style suites, a new entrance with box office customer service area and a loading dock in addition to the already proposed upgrades in option one. Um, the east end of the arena can accommodate up to three additional premium suites. We've included a revenue breakdown um, of what three additional suites would bring to the venue and the Storm Hockey Club. Um, suites are very lucrative for the venue because we don't share in that revenue with tours. 100% of the revenue generated within those premium suites stays with the venue. Um, profit sharing model also with the Storm will help them stabilize their business model. All WHL teams and the majority of AJHL teams already receive this revenue stream from premium suites. So although premium suites are financially beneficial, um, it do, this does not address our need for additional fixed seats in the arena um, that helps us compete to attract top ranked talent and bring down the overall ticket price to shows. Um, this option also included um, an extended reception area with box office and customer service desk, along with a loading dock to the west of the building that does not impede on the utility corridor that runs along the west side of the building. Um, attached are some preliminary drawings and budget for a design build project of this size. I, I just wanna be clear that these are rough sketches estimates to help us understand the scope of the project. And there's um, like a range of pricing from Turcon attached. Um, if this option was approved, these are not the set drawings or design. Uh, we'd go through the full procurement process um, starting at the beginning. But the estimated cost of this option is around $4 million. Option three would explore a full-scale renovation of Revolution Place, addressing the need for more fixed seating and premium seating in the arena, as well as upgrades to the Bose Event Center. Um, the estimated cost of a full renovation is between 30 and 45 million. I mean, it's all depending on amenities included in the project. Um, if we included a breakdown of additional revenue potential, this is if we had the 5,000 seat, um, 20 premium seating options, as well as additional seats or a premium seating option in the Bose Event Center we estimate a $1.3 million increase in additional annual revenue for the facility. Administration would recommend um, a renovation to the current location over a new build in a new location. Revolution Place is such an attractive venue because we have the two unique event spaces and because it's located in the downtown core of the most populated center in the north. Um, and we're really starting to see the creation of event and cultural district in downtown with Montrose, the Live Theater, Mad Hatter's, 
better than Fred and ourselves, all producing content with a walking distance. We're really seeing the creation of that cultural hub in the downtown and love to see that continue. Um, another reason to invest in the current building is the investment made in the rigging grid in 2014. We still have a lot of longevity left in that rigging grid and it's still world class. It is literally the highlight of the venue when tourists come to town. Um, option four uh, is looking at a new build. Obviously a new build is appealing because it's a fresh start. We don't have to worry about any of the obstacles that come with the renovation, um, but a new build is a significant investment for sure. Um, I've included information from the Canalpa Center in Medicine Hat. Um, it's one of the newer arenas um, just completed in 2017 and Medicine Hat has a comparable population to us. So in 2017, the completion of the Canalpa Center cost $74.9 million. That was including all furniture, fixtures, and public art. That's a complete package. So really significant investment. Um, if council did want to move towards a new build, uh, administration would recommend a similar build for the city of Grand Prairie, comparable to what Medicine Hat has. Um, so in conclusion, administration is recommending moving forward with option one in 2020 and looks to present a full-scale renovation with phasing during budget deliberation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ridley. Any questions? Um, anything that you'd like to add, Dr. Uh, Director Miller? Uh, and then uh, to, uh, Mayor Given, go ahead. Sure, yeah, so just a, a question. I just wanna make sure I understood what Catherine just said. So the recommendation is to move forward with the option one and then to get more information about a full renovation at budget. I just wanna, I think that's what I heard. So Catherine, could you just clarify uh, what council might expect to see at budget time? Yes. Thank you, Chair Friesen. Um, that, yeah, that's correct, Bill. I, um, we just felt that the $4 million investment was a big investment to put forward without budget deliberation. Okay. That isn't actually part of your recommendation. So if council wanted to see that, um, we should probably have a motion. Just, I guess, speaking to council members, that's something we wanted to see. I don't think it's currently, administration hasn't been tasked yet to bring that forward to budget. If that was something today that we did want to see, um, my recommendation would be that we should be you know, sort of highlighting that and, and directing the administration to bring forward something further to budget if we, we did want to do something more than just option one. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I, do, I just have one <clears throat> question regarding, so you've got op option one, which has been requested, but then option two with the, um, the seating the box office and the loading dock the financial addition, the the um, values that I see on there are fifty-eight thousand to the venue and twenty-eight to the storm for revenue. I'm scrolling here. I'm missing the expense of that. Is that not broken out on this option? Or if you can you explain that to me? Do you see what I'm asking, Ms. Ridgway? Catherine, do you? So option number, mm -hmm. yeah. So option number two, I see um, the revenue addition, but not a cost of that, an estimated cost of that. You just simply don't have that because it's not recommended. Because it's not being recommended today, or. Sorry, Council President. Yes. So, um, just because we don't have a finalized number for the suite, I'm not completely sure what it's going to cost. We have an estimate from Turcon, um, but this would be the revenue that would be generated from the okay. suite. Yeah. Uh, Chair Friesen, uh, I appreciate what you're asking because it was sort of buried. It's not buried. It's just it's not highlighted in the report. It is there on page four of seven. It says the estimated project cost of four million. So there isn't. Again, I think that's a rough estimate, um, but in terms of what it would the capital cost be to be able to get that additional revenue? Um, oh, that, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, it's, it's in small print. Yeah, I, um, yeah, yeah. Just highlight it the same way. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right. Um, then, uh, if there's no other uh, no other questions, then I guess I'm be looking for. Uh, a well, I'm the, that's a reason that I just say. I know it's hard to see with everybody, but I just did have a couple questions about that, please. Thank you. Go ahead, Councilor Platt. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple questions for administration, just wondering when this, if this is going to come back in the fall. I know something for me, um, and I've been fortunate with being on the store to be able to walk the facility, talk to people, is 
I'm wondering if council is going to have a workshop specifically about this rather than coming to budget. This is a pretty major, uh, potentially a pretty major um, change that we could be doing in budget this year, which you know, I'm looking forward to the conversation. I think this is something we should be chatting about. I'm just concerned about it showing up at the budget with a bunch of paperwork and we're trying to go through drawings and designs and stuff like that. So I'm just wondering if there's going to be some a workshop or something create out once more of this stuff comes out from administration so that we can have a really good topical conversation about this. I'm just wondering what administration's thoughts about, about that are, I guess, uh, before we enter into the fall or into the summer. Thank you. Director Miller? Uh, thanks, Chair Friesen. Uh, we haven't uh, had a discussion about a workshop on it, but we could certainly, I could certainly bring that up at CLT and, uh, and then get back to committee. And uh, perhaps in my next update back at committee, I could provide additional details on that option. I think with uh, what is being recommended today by uh, Ms. Ridgeway is uh, if we proceeded with the renovations for the 544, those, uh, I don't believe those would be throwaway costs or there's minimal throwaway costs. So then the plan would be to bring the bigger project back and have a, a greater discussion at budget time, but we could look at a workshop prior to that. Yeah, that'd be something that would be important to me, Director Miller. I'm not sure whether the rest of the committee or council would be on it for me. And my other question I'd like to answer is just regarding the original motion was about uh, sole sourcing some of these items um, and trying to expedite some of this stuff. So I'm just wondering, um, on the storm renovation specifically, um, how do we, or is there an ability for us to let them go away and properly price this and everything else and have this ready for the fall without being obligated to complete? Um, just if, if administration can, can give me a heads up on how that would look. Thank you, Director Miller. Uh, thanks, Chair Friesen. And I wondered if Catherine maybe had a conversation with uh, with Lan Mr. Brown, uh, Lanny Brown, about that topic. Um, through the chair, I actually had quite a few conversations with procurement and Lanny. Um, we would have to go through the regular procurement process, but um, the timeline is doable. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councillor Plutt. Um, back to, yeah, it's, I do have a difficult time getting used to seeing everyone. Any? Um, I have uh, one, Chair Friesen. Uh, Chair Friesen. Thank you, Councillor Clayton. Um, hi there. Uh, just a question for Director Miller. Um, can you walk me through the numbers again in regards to, I think uh, Ms. Ridgway, last time she presented to committee, sent said that there was money that wasn't being spent that was going back to our bank account. <laughs> um, however, um, the Centergate concession update money is coming out of this now, but there was money that was already sort of a budgeted for some of that. So maybe Director Miller, you can walk me through that. Uh, thanks, Chair Friesen. So we did have some leftover money from uh, capital projects in the past that had not been uh, proceeded with or did we didn't proceed with over the years. So in working with finance, we identified, I think it uh, roughly was around $419,000 of leftover funding. And uh, Mr. Burke might be able to uh, correct me on that number as well. But, and then in addition to that, with, uh, I guess, with uh, the anniversary money that we were hoping to uh, identify and proceed, adding all that together is where we came up with the $544,000 ask. Okay, so maybe my question is for Director Bork, if I can, Chair Friesen. Um, can you tell me how, so Council already identified money from um, money that was recovered to go to this project. Now there's potentially other money. So are we actually not spending all the money that was allocated from uh, Council last meeting? Or where's the implication on this? On this? So this so was, uh, this was uh, part of the part clean up sorry I have some echo uh, this was part of the cleanup from uh, uh, that uh, council looked at the mid-year capital review so I don't think of it as old money and new money it was just the money that was available at that time and um, all of that was uh, put into uh, to one place and allocated to the, the option one uh, project here so the money has been set aside waiting for council to make a decision today on w whether they'd like to proceed this was the only project that we um, we were committed to come back with Okay, Sorry, so shouldn't say that Smith as well. So, Director Bork, then um, at budget deliberation, there was money set aside for center gate concession updates. That money had already been looped into the money from the cleanup. 
Yeah, there was, I believe it was 25,000 from Council Strategic Fund. Uh, this is all part of, uh, of this, uh, this package. Great, thank you. Thank you. And Mayor Gibbons? Thanks, Councillor Friesen. Yeah, so um, uh, I think uh, important discussion is for us to have is, you know, is there any interest from Council in doing any of the other options in addition to, you know, I think administration is telling us, hey, we have the money from identified sources to do option one, we can get started on that right away, and there'll be minimal throwaway costs. I think the question in front of us today is, A, are we okay with that? And, and that would seem to me to be a, an easy yes. Um, I don't know about others. But I think the bigger question is, okay, Council, you said you wanted to see a more comprehensive plan. There's some options in front of you. Are you interested in any of those, uh, exploring any of those further? And, I, and, um, and so I'm curious if we could sort of focus in on that part of the question, what Council members would say. Um, and in terms of um, uh, process, I guess, um, I, I appreciate what Councillor Plot was saying about, about a workshop and Council sort of understanding and design and everything else. Um, I have opinions about that too, um, but at the same time, I think we should be cautious about doing too much over council getting too involved in the design. When previously we were saying, like, let's get this out the door as quickly as possible. My experience has been uh, on different councils, on different projects, when, when we as elected officials get too into the details of design, it takes way, way longer. And, and that's not a criticism on this council. That's just an observation about what we do as elected officials. Um, we should probably, if we're comfortable with it, um, think about the process this way. We should decide whether or not we have an appetite for a dollar amount or a range or whatever, um, a scale of renovation. Direct administration would bring that to budget so we can look at that cost, that dollar amount, in context of all the other spending and costs and pressures, and then decide whether we want to, you know, quote unquote, spend that money. And then there's a process that kicks off from there and consultation with council could be a part of that process. Um, but really the question is, um, do you want to spend any money or not? And, and that's probably the, the thing that we need to decide um, and will probably is appropriate to be decided at budget time. Uh, if we wanted to decide that earlier, um, we, we could do that. that. That would be a little bit out of regular process, but maybe that's called for in this situation. Um, but I think if we could focus on that, do we want to spend, do we want to do a larger renovation or not? If so, how large? Um, and how quickly do we want administration, do we want to make that, sorry, how quickly does council want to make that budget determination? Uh, we could theoretically decide something for 2021 um, before the fall, um, and it would just be a stone that would be locked in the budget, and when we come to budget, we discuss a whole bunch of other stuff, but we wouldn't discuss that big stone because we'd already locked it. That would be a bit unusual, but it's not uh, impossible. We'd basically say, administration, we want to do this, put it in the budget and it's included and done already. And we'll discuss all the other stuff in the fall. So just maybe if we could focus the conversation on those sort of bigger, bigger points. Uh, thank you, Mayor Gibbons. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping. Um, there are a couple hands, Councillor Friesen. Oh, I think it's possible if people, when you're using an iPad, I think it's possible if people don't speak up, their screen probably doesn't come to the top of the pile. For the, for the chair, so you may want to just sort of identify yourself by voice so they can see you. So I do see Councillor Platt again now that I'm, yeah, I have to scroll and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not in the groove with it yet. Councillor Platt? No worries, it's fun uh, chairing Zoom meetings. Um, I, I appreciate what Mayor Gibbon just said because I think for me that is the conversation that, I, that I'd love us to be starting to have. I mean, I probably have an appetite for option two, I'm not sure everybody else is that. Option three scares me a little bit without understanding what we're looking at doing. Um, Option four for me is probably a no at this point, but I don't have enough information about it. So I, I, I think for me, I, I agree with Mayor Gibbon. I think you know we could go around and around on this, and I think at some point uh, it'd be sure nice to give administration some direction on what we're feeling. I'm a little bit early in what I would say I'd want to do. That's the problem I'm having with this. Is I think it's, it's as nice as this is, and I can appreciate Catherine's trying to get something to us as quick as possible to get in front of council and have these conversations, which I think are long overdue. Um, I still, for me, would need more information one on one, and that's why I brought up the workshop is I'd want to know a little bit more things before I could get comfortable with option three or four. But for today, I'm probably comfortable with option two, um, saying if we're spending $4 million, because I guess for me at this point, if we can live along this building for another 10 or maybe 15 years for that kind of money, maybe not bad. 
Uh, but there is a point where we have to discuss at what point do we see this, this building coming to its end life and is this throwaway money if we see us wanting to rebuild in five years. So even option two for some people might be hard to swallow if they're actually interested in option three and four and want to do a big building. So I'm, uh, to Mayor Gibbons' point, I'm not sure how that enters conversation or, or if we're looking for motions or if this is, I guess, back to my workshop kind of comment. But I do think um, this isn't a, probably a conversation we're going to deal with in, in a, at a community meeting today, in my opinion. But I, I, I don't know what next steps are and what administration would like to see us come out of this with council because I know I think we've all talked about this at some point on our term and recently I know quite a few of us talked about this so um, just kind of curious what one administration is hoping for from today regarding options two, three, and four. Um, is there, would you, or Director Miller, would you like to answer that? Uh, well, before I do, uh, Chair Friesen, I think uh, Councillor Minhas was uh, trying to ask a question as well. Okay, go ahead, uh, Councillor Minhas. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Friesen. I, I like the, what uh, Mayor Bill given us, give the suggestion and we should be looking into the budget. But I like to wonder if that $14 billion government uh, going to subsidize, uh, not subsidize, they're going to give the money to the to municipalities. If we get some money for this kind of project, we can add it. But I like, like Obed said, you know, number two option, $4 million. And if it's easy to... If, but before the budget, if the money comes and see where we can use that money, I'd like to, to put in this. The reason is because this is in downtown and we have to we keep this facility upgraded and keep in the shape for, till we decided or we have money in the future to build a new one. Second, uh, second option, I really like it, but third one, if we get the federal money grant somewhere sometime, then we maybe look into it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Director Miller? Uh, thanks. Hank, Mayor Given has uh, had his hand up as well. Uh, he, he did, but he sent me a message that you can speak first. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. So okay, thank yeah. you. <laughs> All right. Uh, so just to, uh, to Councillor Platt's question, uh, I think uh, Ms. Ridgeway did comment about, uh, you know, that, like we're, we're trying to enhance the downtown core and make it a cultural, uh, recreational type uh, core of the city. So we are certainly interested in uh, option two, and I know that was the motion was option two to bring back a design build. We thought uh, option one or the 544 was a good uh, topic to, or a good amount to recommend today, but administration is certainly interested in pursuing uh, other options for the future. I think Ms. Ridgeway did say option two would be, uh, would put us in good shape for a few years to come and would really enhance the use of the facility. So. Uh, Speaking for administration, I think we'd be prepared to bring back additional information. She didn't. Uh, I pushed her pretty hard to get the, the report ready today, so we could proceed with uh, work while the facility is uh, not being used, and also get local uh, folks to work was uh, part of the plan. But if there is direction or a motion today to bring back additional information, more detailed information, I guess on option two, what it would look like, and more firm costs, we could uh, certainly do that. And even through committee, might be a, a venue to do it. Just, uh, but I guess we're hopeful today to, to receive approval on the 544 with minimal throwaway costs. Thank you. Okay, I do have Mayor Given in the queue and I also see Councillor Blackburn, but I'm just gonna jump in here. Um, I, I, I'm hopeful that we will get uh, a motion to proceed with, um, with option one straight away today. And I, and I do think that this is uh, a, very reasonable, both in cost and in um, the end of the of that um, option. The the uh, comment that is in the report about tracking some trends that are happening in the inter entertainment industry post COVID. Um, I don't think anyone really has a good sense yet of how things are going to change as we've seen innovation happen over the last few months. <clears throat> so um, I, I think giving time for uh, um, tracking that a little bit to have it come back at, at budget would be appropriate. Uh, Councillor Platt and I took a walk around the facility the other day and talked a little bit about it. And <clears throat> it seems to me um, that, that that, you know, four to $5 million range may very well be reasonable um, but to 
really put a fine point on what that looks like post COVID I think is important. So I, I'm hopeful that we can go ahead with the, um, the first option and Director Miller has indicated relatively few throwaway costs. And there are a few things in here that, that do point to what even current trends are. Um, the box office would, would be more in line with the trend to online ticketing and not having um, paper tickets, that sort of thing. So that's kind of where I land in it. And uh, so I have Director Miller and then we'll go to you, Councillor Black, or, sorry, um, Mayor Given, and then we'll go to you, Councillor Black, Lindsay. So I wonder um, if it would be helpful to get the one thing, well, uh, so I'm happy to put a motion on the floor and then we have something to discuss in the debate. Would, would that be Thanks. helpful to everybody? And sorry to sort of preempt you, Councillor Blackburn, but um, so I'd move, I'd move the recommendation and uh, so if I could do it that way, I'm not going to repeat the entire recommendation, but I remove the recommendation in the report and then I have a further sort of portion of that. Um, and direct administration um, bring forward to a council committee the whole meeting additional information on options two and three, uh, including uh, cost of debt servicing, potential funding sources, and um, purchasing process. Uh, so I appreciate that at this, so, so I just wanna make sure that uh, whoever's recording got that. Um, basically just saying we'd like to go to a council committee of the whole and options two and three that we'd like to know about potential funding sources, potential cost of debt servicing, and uh, potential, um, I wanna say purchasing uh, process. Uh, so those three main things, I'm not speaking specific to detailed design. I know that at this stage, we're in a process of refinement or if everybody wanted to sort of imagine a funnel, um, we're starting very, very wide and we're kind of starting to narrow down a little bit. Um, and so that's, that, you know, we're not picking the fabric by any means at this stage. Um, that's the intent of my motion that, that would start to move us down that funnel, refine some of the information so we could compare and contrast those two different options and decide whether or not we have an appetite to see any of those uh, in the fall or, or would want to budget for either of those or none of those. Um, but that's the intent of the motion is to say, yes, let's get out of the way the stuff that we already have money for that won't be throwaway costs. That part, that's uh, a part of my motion. And then this direction to administration to bring us further down that process of refinement by getting us additional de those additional details on those two options. Thank you, Mayor Gibbons. So that motion is on the floor and I think it's um, Ms. Van Beekville. Did you get the, the elements after the and in the motion? Yep, I got it all. If you want me to read it, I can. Um, no, we may come back to that, but um, okay. as long as you've got it for now, that's great. And um, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Friesen, I was just going to ask for some clarification. I think I heard Ms. Ridgeway say earlier that if we were to approve uh, option one um, and take uh, deliberations for option two and three to, um, to budget deliberation, that the timing would still be okay to get things done uh, sort of the way we wanted to. Did I understand that correctly, Ms. Ridgway? Sorry, through the chair. Uh, I don't think if we did through budget deliberations, we'd be ready for the fall. I think we'd need to start moving on it pretty quickly. Thank you. Yeah. You're muted, Councillor Friesen. Thank you. We have the motion on the floor um, for the recommendation and then bringing back some options, uh, some, um, some information regarding options two and three. Any discussion? Uh, okay. Just if, if I can jump in, Councillor Friesen, uh, Chair yeah. Friesen. I just I like the motion. I just wonder if, um, if in that motion, one of the questions on, on option three is it's talking about revenue that was brought up a little bit earlier, but I don't know what the expense implications would be if we did option three. So if that could be part of the report coming forward. If, it, if it's truly a 1.2 or $3 million swing in our cash flow, it, it probably makes my decision a little bit easier, but I'm not sure if there's going to be, you know, added staffing, extra custodial, extra extra costs where this 1.3 million ends up being 400,000 or something. So for me, I'd kind of like to see the business case around it, I guess, when we're doing that. I think it's great information for us. Um, so 
know if that's a, a friendly amendment that could be added to that, just so that we could we could have that captured within the same report. Well, I guess uh, so. I, I, Chair Friesen, I just would ask administration if they, you know, I know there is the old report on the expansion that does have some of that kind of information. Catherine, is that some high level, you know, high level sort of uh, expense information, operating expense information? Is that is it possible for you to have some sense or estimate of that at this stage? Yeah, Mr. Chair. Sorry, yes, absolutely. Mayor Gibbons, yeah, we'd be able to figure that out easily. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? All right. I'm looking for a, um, a call to question then. All in favor of the motion? So that is unanimous. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ridgway. Now we are um, on to outstanding items list. Please, Director Miller. All right. Uh, thanks, Chair Friesen. Uh, I think uh, item 1084, the archives report, uh, we're still on track for September 1st. And then uh, with community group funding, all the applications are in and uh, have been reviewed and uh, by finance plus uh, SDWC team. So uh, June 24th, it's a CCW on that uh, item. And then uh, the last one, 1091, we can remove today then I guess, and uh, we'll bring back, uh, we'll schedule a CCW unless uh, you want that added to uh, the outstanding items list, but otherwise we'll, uh, we'll bring it forward in the future. So it could be removed if uh, committee agrees. Uh, I guess I'm looking maybe for some input from my colleagues here or um, Mayor Given it was, or uh, well, Councillor Platt, um, maybe I'll ask you um, where you've landed on, on that. Do you, how important it is to, for you to have some sort of a, um, you had mentioned a workshop. Are you okay with it just coming back to committee? Um, my, my preference, I think, would still be some sort of a workshop, because even on the, the, the BOES and, the, and the, the, the option three on that, um, I think we're going to have very mixed different opinions. My, my fear is that we send administration away to do a major rental when it comes back, and it's not what we're envisioning, and then we've done all this, and it's a process that kind of keeps going. So I would have a preference to, to have a conversation about what this looks like, and, and I guess for me, Specifically on the Bose side, I know we're talking a lot about the Revolution Place side, but on the Bose side specifically is more where I like to have a conversation about we have a 90 to $110 million drawings for a performing arts center on Montreal's cultural space. And I guess I keep envisioning the Bose side could be a beautiful performing arts space. Um, and I probably have enough time to spend more money on that space. But we've got these these projects pending that have been sitting on shelves for a while, and I, th I think for administration as well, they look at those projects. We've spent money on getting them designed and, and looked at. And so I think sometimes it's, it's up to administrator, it's up to council to come back to somebody and say, that project is dead, <laughs> or that project's going to move along. But I think having these documents that aren't necessarily living documents sitting on shelves, um, I don't know if that's necessarily healthy for us. So my update would still be that we have a good conversation about Bose and Revolution Place. Um, before we send them away on a 35 or $40 million uh, exploration. I think option two is great. Option three for me, I have a ton of questions coming out of that. I'd be really worried that come budget time, I couldn't, I couldn't get my answers asked quick and answered quick enough. And in essence, I'd say no to going ahead with something I may actually want to have an update into it. So that's still my preference. Um, so I, I'd be curious to hear what other committee members are thinking. If it's just me, I'll leave it. If it's not, then I would be happy to make a motion and we try to set something up. Yeah, I'm on the fence. Um, Councillor Clayton, please. Thanks. Thanks, Chair Friesen. Um, I guess uh, to Councillor Palat's comments, and maybe uh, Mayor Given can uh, freshen my memory better, but I, I don't know why there's a reference to this as a living document. To my, uh, to my knowledge, for sure, last council um, decided not to go ahead with renovations, and the document and the initiative was put to bed. But I don't know, maybe Mayor Given, can you add in on this? I don't know why um, there's a no, thought that this I, is a living document. No, I, I, you know, I think any of these things are on the, you know, on the shelf until a council of the day chooses to pick them up and do something with them. 
Um, and but so it was de defeated. Last... So really, sure, it's a project that was uh, a proposal that was done once. If you choose to keep it on your shelf, that's great. That's different than saying, hey, we want to do this later. That's not what happened with last council. Last council defeated this initiative. And so this project isn't sitting on a shelf for future consideration. This project has done last council was defeated. Well, yeah, I, I just would say that, well, a couple couple things. First off, we, we don't have to start from zero and, and redo all the work. I mean, some work has been done and we can build off of that. Secondly, I thought sure. that the motion that I made, I, well, I know that the motion that I made was direct administration to bring that additional information to a council committee of the whole. So it isn't the committee where there's only four people on it. It's everybody, which I don't know if there's a difference. Well, actually, I do know that there's a difference between a workshop and a council committee of the whole. Council committee of the whole can actually give administration direction and make some kinds of decisions. Um, where a council workshop is, is maybe um, offers a different opportunity to have a sort of a different kind of discussion and dialogue, um, but a council committee of the whole, I think, can meet the intent that council plot talking about. So I, I thought that the motion that I made said, hey, we want to get back together in a forum where all council members are part of that committee, um, where we can have a good discussion on this one topic and get all the information that we want. And if there's any business or action arising from that, we'll be in a position to actually make some motions and give administration some direction. At a workshop form, you know, or for, in a workshop venue, we wouldn't be in a similar position to direct administration to do anything coming out of that. We'd have to set up another council committee to do it. So that was the intent was to say, let's get everybody together where we're all in a voting position and a discussion position um, and in a position to be able to direct administration if we choose to do anything. Thank you. Uh, Director Miller? Thanks, Chair Friesen. And I think that was my understanding too, is the CCW would uh, facilitate the workshop type concept. And what I was referencing is if you wanted to add the CCW onto the outstanding item list, just for tracking purposes, and then we would uh, bring it back within uh, a short uh, yeah. of time. If I may, that was gonna be my, my question is, if, if it's off of our outstanding items list, is it tracked elsewhere or should we leave it on here until such a time as um, this has been addressed at CCW. Just administratively, what's the? Uh, well, I'm fine just leaving it. We, I guess we changed the item number, just make it, yeah. uh, now it's a reference to a CCW to bring back additional information on uh, Rev Place. Yeah, I think that's what I'd like to see. Keep it on here with the, um, that, or as a new item perhaps, yeah. um, because it is a little different direction now to have the, uh, the, two, um, the two options. Thank you. All right, then, uh, a motion to accept the outstanding items list as amended. Sorry. There we go. Um, Councillor Friesen, I'd be willing to make that motion. Uh, thank you. Um, Councillor Clayton, and all in favor? Great, thank you. All right, and that ends uh, the community services meeting. Thank you, everyone, for your patience with me. Thank you very much, Efrizin. You've done your meeting, and now it's our started cooperative service committee meeting, which is uh, uh, Council Friesen, Governor Tool, and Mayor Gibbon, and me, our partner. So let's start it with the uh, director, Marvel Warning Chain. Oh, you're right on the wall there, buddy. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Minhas. Uh, we have a full agenda, so I will just hit uh, the big highlights here. Um, as you would have seen your mailbox, likely, uh, tax notices uh, have started uh, um, um, showing up in mailboxes as of yesterday. Um, the front counter at City Hall is open for people to pay taxes, but we're encouraging all that, uh, that uh, can to, uh, to use our, some of our online methods that are listed on the back of the, uh, the tax notice. Uh, we are encouraging those who are able to pay to pay now to help maintain city operations but the deadline is uh, August 31st. Uh, it's been directed by council. If you cannot make that deadline, um, we still have the options to contact our tax and assessment department to make uh, some payment options uh, throughout the end of the year. Um, you will get a uh, update here momentarily from Reg on the budget timeline. Administration has started uh, the process uh, in line with uh, getting ready for the fall. Um, our chief financial officer will then talk about our current financial situation provide some recommendations on uh, um, some tax rates that we would, uh, a target we'd like to start working for for the fall. So that'll come up uh, momentarily. Um, 
few other things. Uh, procurement, as you heard from uh, Director Glavin, uh, have been busy helping uh, get the stimulus work and our regular work uh, out the door for, for our short construction season, and that has been progressing uh, very quickly. Um, you know, uh, if you're in the in, if you're looking for uh, a bike, a uh, big bus, or a printer, uh, Gov Deals has a number of items uh, listed on it uh, uh, right now. Uh, bikes are there in lieu of our traditional bike auction. Uh, with COVID, uh, we are supporting enforcement to uh, to push that out through through Gov Deals. So there are 15 bikes on there as of uh, as of this morning. Um, some of the things that you'll be noticing this week are. The, uh, the, um, the launch of uh, the Canada Day activities. Uh, it's a little bit different this year, a lot more virtual activities. There'll be a media release outlining the city's uh, um, activities for Canada Day going out later today. And tomorrow, another thing that uh, Communications is helping with is an initiative uh, It's called GP Connected at Home. This is really just a gathering of a whole bunch of things that, um, that the city's doing to support activities at home. There'll be a few new ones that'll be launched uh, as of tomorrow uh, for some uh, early ones or some little ones. And uh, that is all for my update here today. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sheen. Uh, is there any question on uh, Dr. Verbal information? Uh, I don't need to see it anybody, so we can move on to 1.102 uh, budget process, progress check in. Rich, yes, sir. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Chair and uh, Councillors. Um, administration made a commitment to Council to keep you informed of the 2021 budget process. To that end, I will quickly run through a set of slides that shows um, Council where we are at in the budget process and how we will be putting together the 2021 budget. Um, after my presentation, the, CF, the CFO will follow with, uh, with the recommended tax range um, for your discussion. Keeping, uh, keeping with the PBB model, the 2021 budget will be developed uh, with council strategic plan as the foundation for decision making. Uh, the process will be a responsive process to overcome the challenges um, that we're facing now, um, take advantage of open opportunities and to provide council with evidence that supports decisions that affect the lives of residents of uh, the city of Grand Prairie. Uh, there are three key things administration will be looking at improving for the 2021 budget. These are providing relevant information to assist um, in current decisions that will have long-term results, tax range, tax rate changes that can maintain and sustain the community in this environment, and also tax rate changes as a result of growth, um, inflation or deflation, um, service delivery changes and others. As can be seen on the slide, um, up, uh, I'm not sure if this slide is up. But uh, the priority, uh, the priority-based budgeting process involves four phases. Um, the focus of this update is to let council know of your involvement in the process. Um, your involvement in the process will be uh, can be seen on the on the highlighted. Can be seen, can be seen in, um, in the boxes that I highlighted red um, in the various phases of the process. Um, and also just to, just to highlight those dates um, where council's involvement will be um, needed. Council's involvement will be required in the three phases of, uh, of the budget process. In phase one, which is uh, today, administration will take, will, will like to ask that council determine a tax range uh, within the recommended range that will be presented by the CFO after my presentation for administration to work towards um, that for the 2021 budget. Within the same phase, administration will launch uh, a public engagement campaign to get the inputs of our residents and businesses as we develop the 2021 budget. The second council check-in will be um, in phase two of the process, and uh, this meeting will take place early August. And during this meeting, administration will present council with uh, budget updates and relevant information found as the process proceeds. A third check-in will take place early October before the budget, um, before the public budget deliberations in November. Um, the budget book containing all information needed for deliberations will be printed and distributed to council 
no later than October 16th, um, allowing for over two weeks of review time prior to deliberations. As done in prior year, we will accept um, any questions that may arise from your review up to the Friday before the deliberations. Um, council will be presented with a recommended budget and impact of decisions made staying with the grouping of um, the green or low impacts, the yellow or moderate impacts, and the red or high impacts for review um, from November 14th, November 4th to uh, November 6th of, uh, of this year. The budget will be presented to City Council meeting on November 16th um, for your approval. Um, and but on that note, um, I'll be um, open to answer any questions um, before the CFO takes over. And will anybody have a question on uh, this statement? Uh, somehow I can take this. Clive? Clive, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Councillor Minhas. Um, if I heard you correctly, Mr. Hammond, you said that the first thing that you would be asking for from Council is. Um, uh, a tax increase range, a percentage range. Am I correct there? Uh, the CFO will be coming forward right after this presentation with a recommended um, tax change um, range uh, for for discussion, and um, and then we'll we'll proceed from from that point. Thank you. I'll I'll look forward to that part of the presentation. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Is anybody else a question? Because I can't see anybody because it's covered with the thing there. Chairman, ask, this is Dylan. I've got some questions. Go ahead, Dylan. Great. Um, a question I've got is just I'm seeing in here where factors like growth, infl inflation, and service changes get built into the budget. I'm seeing where we identify gaps in the budget and presumably where we need increases to fill those gaps. but where do savings get built in this budget in terms of where we're becoming more efficient and we're finding savings from, from lean? How does, where in the budget does that get flexed in? So these changes will be, um, will be factored in those, uh, in those uh, different columns as well. We, when we're talking about inflation, we could be talking about deflation as well. So these changes are not just increases, but savings as well and um, efficiency improvement. Um, Savings as a result of efficiencies and and um, and other, other other tasks that we're doing to reduce um, the budget and see savings. So just a just a recommendation I've got as you folks think about engagement and and these documents. Of I I really get to work alongside you and I get to see how aggressively our team's going after savings and I've really got confidence that Lean and PBB are finding results in our organization. I don't think a lot of members of the public see this. So I think that there's a lot of members of the public who would see, oh, they're building growth, they're building inflation, they're building service changes, and they'd and I think they'd often read that as service changes mean service increases. And it might be a good idea to more explicitly say we're looking for those savings. It makes me nervous that I don't see that. And there's just a general piece of feedback. But also something, I don't know if this is where, um, if this is the appropriate place to have this conversa conversation or if you can suggest another place for me to bring it up but I I felt that there that I that when it comes to budget deliberations I would find it useful to get more benchmarking than we got last in our last cycle both comparators to other Alberta mid-sized cities but also even I found it difficult to compare our 2020 budget with our 2019 budget I felt like I wasn't getting good comparison comparison data to help me make my my decisions and I'm wondering where we have the conversation about if I'm the only one feeling that way or if the rest of council would like more information presented to them. I will say that this is exactly the intention this year is exactly to kind of meet those needs and be able to provide some more um, some just more information of the year over year changes and what's impacting our budget. Um, so we're fully, that's what we're preparing for to come into deliberations with. 
Cool. Well, I'm just, I, I, I guess what I'm wondering then is, is in terms of what information you're going to be giving us year over year, is there going to be another point where you check in and say, hey, here's the year over year things that we're preparing and we're going to be presenting? Does that fit what you guys want? I just hate to be in budget deliberations in November and getting my budget book two weeks before budget and have to say to you folks, hey, I'm really hoping to get all of this information that's not here and send you guys scrambling is what I want to avoid. Um, yes, yeah, so as, as identified uh, on the last, last slide, uh, we have a couple more check-ins uh, before the deliberation, and we will be um, uh, addressing some of these um, concerns before deliberation and also during deliberation. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dylan. Is any, anybody else have any questions? I don't see it. So we, do we need the motion on to receive the information, or we don't? Yeah, yeah, the Chairman, we should probably have a motion for anything that comes on the agenda. Uh, so I'd move that we receive this uh, budget process update for information. Motion on the table. Nobody had a question on it. All in favor? Motion carried unanimous. So the next one is 1.3 one, 1. 21 tax rate target. Daniel, are you online? Oh, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Haas. Uh, good morning, committee. So um, I'm here today just to do a verbal update uh, as to kind of where we are in 2020, uh, as well as our anticipation for 2021 at this point in the year. So if you remember at 2020 budget deliberations back in the fall of 2019, we had originally presented a 1.5% increase for 2020. Um, this was also with a 3.6% tax increase for 2021. We uh, concluded budget deliberations with uh, 1.25% for 2020, resulting in a potentially higher forecasted increase of 3.8%. Uh, in late 2019, subsequent to deliberations, uh, steps were made to reduce operating costs, with city administration taking some necessary steps to right-size the organization, while still allowing for service to continue as expected, but of course at a reduced cost. And so far, 2020 has been a year that none of us has expected. As with many other municipalities, we've been financially impacted by COVID-19, and as a city, we are supporting our citizens, businesses, and the vulnerable population within our city. In addition to this, we've lost a number of revenue streams, predominantly in uh, community services, uh, with uh, free transit and facility closures. But we've also seen impacts to revenue related to construction projects being delayed, lost penalty revenue with the cancellation of two penalty dates, uh, an unbudgeted tax rebate for uh, COVID-19, and we've seen a significant reduction in our traffic safety enforcement revenue. Support to citizens has been provided in a number of forms. GPREP launched a community care program. Councils provided relief for taxes in the form of reduced penalty dates in 2020 and a rebate on every taxpayer's 2020 notice. Businesses have also benefited from those same tax relief measures, as well as support via brief GPREP and city departments through business relaunch support, the PT for Biz program, business ambassadors, business resiliency grants, and the hashtag Love Local GP campaign. GPREP and the city have also supported our vulnerable population by supporting local FCSS organizations, creating the hotel isolation program to support those in homelessness showing symptoms of COVID, and responding to provincial mandate to create additional physical space for vulnerable populations through the temporary COP program. And on top of all this, in the midst of the pandemic, GPREP supported a neighboring community with spring flooding issues. Complete shutdowns of recreation and event facilities have stopped revenue flows and forced refunds for cancellations. Free transit and a slowdown in construction hit our revenue budget as well. Closure of parks and schools paired with the direction to reduce traffic enforcement measures to only high collision areas have dropped these tickets to less than half of those issued in a normal year. Revenue loss up to mid-May has been estimated just short of 1.3 million in community service, community services. 
And if operations remain as they are now into the fall, this number could reach as high as $4 million. Lost penalty revenue for May was $350,000, with a potential loss of another $500,000 in September. The rebate program was uh, approved at a total of $1.56 million, and reduced traffic tickets issued has been estimated to have lost around $1.2 million to date, but of course will increase as long as the current approach to enforcement is maintained. GPREP costs and costs for supporting citizens' businesses and the vulnerable population have um, come out to approximately 800,000 to date. Administration's fortunately to this point been able to offset those costs and lost revenues with savings from layoffs, redeployments and efficiencies. However, facilities of course require some staff, maintenance, cleaning, upkeep, supplies, utilities, debt payments as well. Um, the buses still require fuel, maintenance, and staff to operate. And additionally, we've seen that re redeployment of staff from our closed facilities has a greater cost than hiring seasonal staff. Benefits are still being paid to those employees that were laid off, and planning for gradual reopening of some facilities has meant unplanned costs associated with ensuring appropriate social distancing, proper sanitation, and protection of staff and citizens. So as we look into 2021, we are faced with continued impacts of social distancing, increased precautions, and the likelihood of having to provide more for less in the future. Many questions just still remain unanswered. We, will we have maximum occupancy levels at events and recreation facilities for the foreseeable future? How long will social distancing, increased sanitation, and PPE be required? We need to determine what impacts helping to prevent the spread will have on our future budget and forecast, potentially impacting ongoing revenues, costs, initial growth assumptions to the tax base, and the uncertainties of future inflation given the economic, current economic condition. All of these things are being collabor collaboratively analyzed for 2021 budget preparation. We've now made a budget a year long cycle as presented before me by Reg Hammond and the first phase of, phase of our budget team's annual process has almost completed. This has involved review of budgets, research and analysis of trends and gearing up for departments to begin developing their 2021 budget and 2022 to 2024 forecast. Departments will do so using the 2020 base budgets as approved by council and determining impacts of uh, inflation and deflation, growth, contractual obligations, efficiencies, service delivery changes, and other potential required changes, including, of course, the ongoing impacts of COVID-19. So despite the unknowns and in combination with the steps we've taken to date, we are prepared to share an initial estimate for the potential tax change in 2021. Of course, under the assumption that there are still months ahead of work before deliberations this fall. We're confident that an increase of one and a half to two and a half percent is realistic and achievable for 2021, allowing us to continue the multitude of services that the city provides to our taxpayers and incorporate potential ongoing impacts as presented. The work done to date has allowed us to drop our initial assumptions made in the fall 19 deliberations of 3.6% to this manageable achievable range. And when preparing budgets and presenting in the fall, administration will ensure that council is provided the impacts of any decisions being made. Staying with the grouping of green for low impact, yellow for moderate impact, and of course red for the higher impact. Although we are still early in our budget process, we did feel it to be prudent to share our preliminary assumptions and the ongoing challenges that we are faced with. Although a range of one and a half to two and a half is what we are recommending, administration would like to ask the council determine a target, preferably within this range that they would like us to work towards for the 2021 uh, budget. And that at the next meeting with all members in attendance, a motion is made for council's expected target for the 2021 tax base change. This will enable us to prepare accordingly and ensure that proposals made at deliberations will meet council's expectations. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Daniel. And anybody had any question on Daniel's report? Mm, I don't see it. If it's not, can we get have a motion? To, oh, wait, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Chairman Haas. <clears throat> Appreciate the report, Daniel. I know this is a uh, challenging time. It's tough to be budgeting on this stuff. So lots of variables for the city, more than most organizations are going through. I don't know if people understand this, all the things we have sometimes. So I uh, like the range. I just, I, I had one question regarding budgeting, and I'm just wondering um, if it's been discussed or looked at. But has the city ever looked at, uh, maybe not across the entire organization, but within specific departments, doing zero-based budgeting? Um, Instead of having an, an annual rollover budget that every year organizations come, um, I'm saying that more because that's pretty much being forced upon everybody else uh, right now in the world. Um, I know governments are a little bit different organizations, but I'm just wondering if we have departments that we've at least looked at saying, start with a zero budget, tell me why you need money, tell me what it's for, instead of just going off our historical year over years that we've done traditionally. Go ahead, Daniel. Thank you, Chairman. Us. Um, so zero percent um, budgeting is we do. Sorry, sorry, not zero percent. Zero base budgeting. So zero base budgeting. Sorry, budgeting. yeah. 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 Sorry. So it's not um, that we stick with the priority based budgeting. That's our budgeting uh, theory. All of our um, all of our departments provide services, um, and what we are trying to achieve is. Um, we still push them to realistically look at what they need to provide those services and that the services we're providing are um, in line with what council strategies are. So that's where this year with, again, and like we've done in prior, but we're more trying to um, solidify our process for decision-making, but really looking at our priorities and our service deliveries and, and pushing departments to be able to provide service at the best cost that they can. And just within your forecast, uh, Ms. Whiteway, was there any hope or uh, funds allocated that we would be getting anything back from the province to the federal government as more programs, or is this just assuming that we're internally just figuring this out and if money shows up, great, but it's not baked in the budget? Daniel? Thank you. So any, um, any kind of programs that we're aware of now are, are more capital-based and we haven't when it comes to operating, um, we don't have anything at this point, um, or we haven't received any indication that we'd be able to receive any additional funding in our future budget. Okay, thank you. Clyde? Thank you, uh, Councillor Minhas. Uh, I, I guess the first thought that came to my mind regarding zero-based budgeting uh, Councillor Palat, is that the first time that I was asked to do that many, many, many years ago, um, I, uh, I did up a budget that was based on what we need. And the response that came back from our central office was, well, that's nowhere near what you had last year. So, <laughs> so it started out as zero base, but uh, everybody's tendency is to look at what we've done in the past. And I really do encourage um, council to con continue with uh, priority-based budgeting, which um, being better than zero-based, it, it says, okay, if you're in an area that's going to get down to the third or the fourth quartile, then you better be justifying your needs uh, really well in order to be able to uh, get enough budget to operate with. So I'm happy with that. The, the comment I wanted to make is regarding the range uh, the request to provide a range. And uh, I hope that this year committee and, in, and eventually council uh, will be willing to look very seriously at uh, going with the higher end of the range. I, I know that, that many of uh, my fellow councillors um, uh, were trying to fulfill election promises by, by keeping uh, our increases as low as possible and even getting into the business of um, uh, uh, tax decreases rather than increases. But I think that everybody recognizes that 
with the uh, advent of COVID-19 and all of the things that have happened as a result of that, um, we're going to be in a cost recovery mode for a while. And, uh, and I, hope that, I hope that we will give some practical consideration to um, making that recovery as um, palatable as possible, but certainly not trying to think of um, uh, minimal um, increases at the same time. So I would encourage folks to think along the lines of uh, the, the higher end, if not the top end, of the recommendation from Ms. Whiteway. Thank you. Thank you, Clyde. So any, oh, Mr. Dillon, right on, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just curious, uh, one of the biggest financial liabilities I'm worried about in the next few years is RCMP funding with the effects of collective bargaining, both seeing a big bump in our contract price and also potentially having to pay out a one-time adjustment due to the legal fight that they had. Uh, what assumptions around RCMP funding are being built into our budget as it's being developed? Daniel, you have one to for it. Thank you, Chairman Az. So um, we have, we will build in um, what the expected contract will be, what the wage increases will be. Um, we are able to get that from um, from the RCMP directly. Uh, so they do help us build those budgets. Um, and as well, we um, are putting aside and hoping to bring within our reserve strategy uh, towards the end of the month. Uh, the necessary funds to pay that potential one-time payment for the for the bargaining costs for those officers. Great, thank you. Thank you. So there's no uh, the director Shane. Uh, thank you, Chairman Hoffman. I just wanted to give a process uh, suggestion here. Um, the intent of today was just to highlight um, the effort we're putting into doing budget a little bit differently. In that um, we've restructured and we have Reg now. Uh, um, as the yearly basis looking at our budget. Uh, Danielle's provided a, a lot of thoughtful analysis here and it's a lot of information to, to absorb. Um, our, our intent was uh, for, for the direction to come from uh, the next council meeting where all members uh, could vote. We wanted to give time for, for you to, to process and ask us any questions about uh, our analysis to date. So our, our recommendation would either this just be an agenda item on the next council meeting or the motion out coming out of this to be that um, that uh, council at the next meeting um, have this uh, discussion and, and set a target rate for, for administration. Thank you, Dr. Shane, to update. Uh, Wade, do you have something? Uh, thanks, uh, Chairman Huss. It was kind of along what uh, Director Bork just said, is that, you know, this is gonna be a conversation or are we looking at trying to have a motion coming out of today with a range or if that's gonna come up, but if it's coming to another uh, council, um, with a range of one and a half to two recommended by administration for us to debate, that would be that would be much appreciated. So that's great. Thank you. So um, I don't see anybody in the queue, yeah. so we need the motion. Thank, go ahead, uh, Bill uh, Gibbs. Well, yeah, just so Councillor Minhas, I just want to clarify, um, Director Bork, in terms of process, um, getting this to council. So we could have a motion today uh, that council have a discussion about this, but then when it gets to the council table, somebody would have to make a motion to identify a target. Um, so we, we I, is, is, yeah. did I understand you correctly when you yeah. said that that was possible? Like, Well, it, it, uh, Chairman Haas, uh, yeah. it, it was to have the, the distinction between having committee with limited votes, um, having the debate today and, and passing a motion, um, or whether we put a target discussion on the next agenda item um, for the reserve for the next council meeting would be would be our recommendation. Oh, thank so, you. okay, thanks. So, Councillor Manhoff, you, you know, I uh, appreciate that not all of our colleagues can vote here. Um, this would be one of those situations where, in, in order to move things forward, um, I think we should, you know, pass the motion here and then discuss and debate it at council. Um, people can change their votes, whatever. But you know, we need to. I, I don't think we should put administration in a, in a position of asking them to identify the target. Um, I think that that's up to council. And we'll all have different opinions on that, and that's how it should be. Yeah, that's what that's what all of us around the council table is for. Um, so I'm I'm happy to start that uh, here. Um, if my council call, even if it is you know the four of us that are voting, I would ask everybody to to appreciate that the intent of this is to move it forward to council. 
so that all of us can vote on it. Um, so I move that the uh, committee recommend council set a 2021 budget target of uh, 2% property tax increase, period. Um, and in speaking to that, um, that is on the top end of the range. Probably lots of different opinions about that. I would say to my council committee members that are voting on this issue, uh, that your support uh, at this stage doesn't necessarily mean that you need to support it at council. All of us need to have the ability to be flexible and to change our opinions based on information that we receive. Um, a vote in support of this today is a vote to get it to the council table so all nine of us can vote on it there. So motion on the table, is there any question on the motion? I don't see it. If there's no, all in favor? Thank you, motion carries. The next one is 104, loan bylaw amendment C1350A and C1396A. Daniel, you're on the queue again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman Oz. Uh, so I'm here today just to recommend that committee uh, recommend council give three readings to bylaw C-1350A and three readings to bylaw C-1396A. Um, both uh, organizations, that's the Army, Navy and Air Force Veterans Unit uh, 389, as well as the Swan City Hockey Association, have both uh, requested that the city allow deferral of payment on their outstanding loans in light of their cash flow constraints due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Deferral of payment for both of these organizations would allow them to better manage their cash flow during uncertain times. And it has minimal financial implications for the city that can easily be managed by administration. Thank you. So, any question on uh, the deferral of the payment? And I have one, if not, how long they want to defer? I, I read it, but I just didn't say the timeline is six months, three months. Uh, Daniel? Thank you, Chairman. So the, um, the Army, uh, Navy, and Air Force, they have annual payments, so they would be asking to skip this year's payments or defer this year's one payment. Um, the Swan City they've, the Hockey Association has asked to defer one payment. Thank you very much, update. And besides that, the, defer that full payment or they will still pay the interest the difference? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, they will. Um, interest will still be calculated as usual. It's just a deferral of their one payment. Yeah. Essentially, it will increase slightly their uh, payments going forward. Thank you. Mel, we're given, go ahead. Yeah, Danielle, can you uh, tell me what the balance owing on each of these is? Certainly, just give me one moment here. So with the um, Army, Navy and Air Force veterans, they just owe uh, two payments. So the original indebtedness was 26,000, will payable over six years. Um, so it's just two payments left. So they'll miss this year's and then uh, pay Sorry. Yeah, and then they'll they'll pay it off next year, and then. Um, can you give me a dollar value, Danielle? Can you give me a dollar value yeah. for each of them? Okay. Sorry, I'm just gonna pull up first. So the um, Swan City Hockey Association, um, after their last payment, their balance was a one hundred and eighty-one thousand eight sixty-four. And the, I'll need, I'll probably need a moment on the, I'll just do the, the quick math on the, uh, on the other one. So it was, it was to be repaid over five years with annual installments of uh, 5,364. So then they would owe two payments. So their balance would be 10,728. Thank you. Any other question? If there's not, can we put the, go ahead, Kevin. Oh. 
Kevin? So that would include or the interest, correct? Yes. At this point in time? Um, for yes, the... Sir. But for the, I'm just looking at the uh, Army, Navy, Air Force. At this time, it, that that number there that you gave us would include the interest, correct? Uh, no, so that one was given interest free, so it's just principal owing. So the ten thousand would just be principal. We're not charging that one interest. Okay, thank you. Okay, Bill, you go ahead. Yeah, so Chairman Huss, um, and I don't know if anybody else is thinking this way, but uh, certainly on the, the Swan City Hockey, that's a significant amount of money left owing, and, and there's a process for that, and that's a bit of a different enterprise. Um, I wonder if any other council members have an interest in, in forgiving the 10728 uh, at the Army, Navy, Air Force veterans. I, I really wonder, I would question um, the value of carrying this over um, for the next couple of years. Uh, we, you know recognize that they've had a difficult time i'm not sure that they're in a position uh, to be applying for grants and i just you know there are many organizations that we provide that amount of money to it would you know the yeah it just it seems like an un unusual thing to do to try to stretch that out over a bunch of years to try to get ten thousand dollars out of an organization that will just as likely being applying to us or to somebody else for grants to be able to do their operations um maybe council should consider that as a grant amount Thank you. Well, we have given uh, Junis. Uh, thank you, Councillor Minhas. Um, I was actually prepared to make a motion, um, but with Mayor Gibbons' comments just now, perhaps I'll make the motion that the that Council um, give readings to bylaw C dash 1396A, and that's it for now. Would that be? So that's the one for Swan City. So you're using a recommendation from the mayor? That the, uh, so, well, I'm, I'm putting them out right now because um, I, I really like what uh, Mayor Given is suggesting. Um, and, and I kind of thought we were ready for a motion, so that's why my hand was up. But, um, so I would suggest we give three readings to, that if we, this committee recommend council give three readings to bylaw C-1396A, which would be to allow the deferral for Swan City Hockey Association. You're muted, Councilor Minhas. Oh, yeah, this Kevin O'Toole, go ahead, motion is on the table. Thank you very much. Uh, so I make a second motion after, and I, I totally agree with Mayor Given. I think that uh, I, the reason I was asking this is, this is a, a lifelong of support to this community, uh, the Army, Navy, Air Force. And I think uh, they've made some uh, payments over the years, and this is an opportune time to show our uh, our appreciation to that organization and forgive that loan at this point in time. And, uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, you. Go ahead. Bid. Thanks, Chairman Haas. Um, I'm going to be the bad guy here and say I would really urge you guys not to do that. Um, I think the precedent that's going to set is not good. I mean, even when the storm lived alone, you wouldn't believe the amount of calls I got from other organizations saying, well, it must be nice to borrow the storm money. Um, we have community group funding. We have other mechanisms to try to help not-for-profits and agencies in Grand Prairie. I think if we just start deferring or, or not asking people to pay us back at all, it sets a really, really slippery precedent. I can realize it's a great organization and if there's a better way we can help, great. But to just start forgiving debt and not asking somebody to pay back something they were contractually obligated to do, I really think that's a slippery slope. We just don't want to go down, you guys. I really caution you to not support that. Um, love the intent of it. I just think if we're getting in COVID here now and we're going to have a hunch, bunch of hands coming in, starting with saying let's just forgive debt is not a good start for us. Um, if we're worried about revenue and protecting our, our investments, um, I really, really love the intent of this. I just think it's a really slippery slope that we do not want to go down, um, especially when this is just starting. Um, this, this will make good news. It should be great. 
And then we're going to have a lot of phone calls from other agencies and organizations saying, what about me? And we can't help everybody. And they've already contractually obligated to do this. So I caution you not to support this as much as it's a great intent. I really hope you don't support this. Thank you, Wade. Uh, Jackie? Jackie Clayton? Thank you, Chairman Hess. Um, I, although I can't vote on this committee, I just wanted to express my opinions. Uh, I uh, echoing Councillor Plot. I think that until we see how the dust settles in the next few months, we have no idea what organizations are going to need grants. And there could be multiple organizations that need grants from $10,000 and up. And, and so to start this precedent with one organization, and although it would be a small amount and in normal time, I, you know, I might even encourage community to support this, but at this time, until we see how the dust settles from COVID, and until we see how our economy comes back, so we see how many people actually can afford to pay their tax bill, so we see what our revenues look like. I just think it's, uh, um, we just need to wait on this. So I would encourage committee to not support this. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Is there any other uh, on this motion? Well, so just so everybody's not confused by the last two comments, the motion that was made is actually about the Swan City Hockey Club and doesn't do anything with the, uh, so just so the people that are voting understand what we're voting on, Councillor Friesen's motion is about Swan City Hockey Club. So that's clear that the Hockey Club is not the Army Navy yet. Okay. All in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. And now we need the second motion. Uh, Mayor, are you going to go ahead and do that? Or? Yeah. yeah, sure. I, I appreciate uh, and respect the comments of Councillors Plot and Clayton. Um, and I will, I will I'll, I'll still make this. Ultimately, we'll have to go to Council for approval, I think, to waive this. Um, and so uh, I'll move that the committee recommend Council uh, forgive the uh, balance owing from the Army, Navy, Air Force veterans um, uh, loan. Uh, and be, that that be uh, waived as a grant to the organization, uh, period. Uh, so that'll be up for discussion to debate at council, um, and we will all get a chance to vote on that how we see fit. Um, and I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, discussion about different points of view there. Um, I, for one, think that the you know sort of the, the burden to the organization and to the city of having to manage that, although it's probably not huge, um, this amount of dollars is also not particularly huge. Um, in this time where we are for giving uh, tax penalties, deferring those sort of things for a lot of users uh, and a lot of taxpayers across the city, I think that this is in alignment with that. Um, and is a it was, and if somebody had a different opinion at council and chose to vote against it, I would you know would blame them for that. It would be completely reasonable to say so. But uh, I'm ready to support this here, and I would also support it at council. Thank you very much, Mel McGarrett. Motion is on the table. For given ten thousand dollars for, go ahead, wait. Although this may come to council and it will be debated there, I, the messaging is going to be taken today, uh, right from our from our news company saying city is going to discuss deferring this. And so I just we could have a conversation at council, guys, but if it gets passed today, um, we've already kind of let people know that we're going to we're open for business and we're looking at deferring and waiving fees and penalties. So I really urge you guys to not support this and put it through like it was originally proposed by administration. But great, I'll be happy to debate it at council when it gets there and they won't support it. Um, but I think supporting this today sends a message right away to the community that we think that we're open for business just to defer and get money away. Thank you, we have your comments and uh, Clyde. Thank you, uh, Councillor Minhas. I, I, I agree with the sentiments that the, that the mayor um, expressed regarding this one. And I would probably at some point vote in favor at council uh, for, uh, for this to happen. But because there's a deferral uh, being proposed at this point, I'm sure that this is a decision that we could make at, at a later date before the next payment becomes uh, due. And so um, in, in, in favor of what Councillor Pallott uh, has to say about this. Um, I, I don't think we need to rush to, um, to a decision regarding uh, forgiveness of this debt at this time. And um, it, 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 it may, uh, even
even though the discussion has uh, has already started, it, it may prompt uh, it may prompt more requests from other groups. But uh, by deferring it until at least sometime before the next payment is due by the uh, by the group, um, perhaps we can avoid some of that uh, rush to the trough. So I would uh, encourage council at this point, or sorry, the committee at this point to um, um, not approve this at, uh, for now, but uh, to keep in mind that it's something that we have another opportunity to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Clyde. Is anybody else on uh, queue? And I see Eunice. Thank you. Go ahead, Eunice. Um, thank you. <clears throat> I think this is going to be a very important discussion that we will have to have um, in, in the near future because um, deferral requests will likely be coming. Um, and, you know, as I've indicated, perhaps we'll get more requests for um, forgiveness about standing and that sort of thing, but, but we're going to need to have that conversation because there may be a place for it. Um, I don't think it hurts to have it go to council at this point, even though I've, I've heard from my colleagues that there is some reluctance to have it go to council. I don't know that I'll support the forgiveness of loans at this point. You know, a, a deferral does give a year and, um, we honestly don't know what's going to happen coming out of this, but we can always forgive it next year, even if we defer it. So I'm, I'm, I, I think that when it does come to council, I'm not likely to support forgiveness at this point, but I do think that it's a conversation that it doesn't hurt to have. And, um, you know, we'll have it now or we'll have it later. We're going to see an influx of people um, wanting what we've given them, whether we have it now or later. So I don't think there's any point in postponing um, some good, uh, fulsome discussion on this. So I will support this motion today, whether or not I support it at council. I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm leaning to not. Thank you, Junus. So Kevin O'Toole, you're on the line again. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Chair Miraz. I, uh, I do feel that I will be supporting it today, and I'm looking forward to discussion on the council committee or council meeting when we have this. So uh, I understand everybody's point of view, and I value everybody's point of view, and uh, we'll see what happens on council meeting night. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I don't see anybody else. I would really be supporting today because it's still going to the council. The all whole council can decide it what they want to do, defer or demolish it. But I will support today. So if nobody else on the queue and all, all the favor. We are all all unanimously passed, so thank you. Motion carried. You've muted yourself, uh, Councillor Minhas. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now we're going to bylaw C 1078F amendment to use of public land bylaw election signs. That was a good one. So, Arlene, you're going to update a little bit, or thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm asking committee today to uh, recommend council give three readings to bylaw C-1078F. And this bylaw amendment presented today expands the uh, number of locations on public lands from 18 to 48. Um, and includes locations throughout the entire city. Uh, I've asked to share my screen to show you the overall maps of the city of Grand Prairie with all of the locations included. Thank you. So 
I think everybody read that. Any question on Arlene? Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, I was just looking to see that overall map. Yeah. So here's the overall map with the 48 uh, election sign locations as indicated. Uh, the additional 30 locations include parkland and uh, lands that um, are free and clear and big um, that will accommodate a large volume of election signs. Some of the locations have landscaping in them, such as trees and shrubs and fences. And there are five locations that I believe may um, be a bit of a challenge to use because the clear zones are a lot larger than the sign zones. Those locations will be are on um, location number eight along 100th Ave. Um, and as you'll see, there's some very small sign zones on this map. Also on location 26, um, due to this, the number of intersections and the, the uh, amount of private land that is along the street, um, there is a rather small uh, sign zone as a result. As well, uh, location 27, similar situation with the number of intersections along the street and the uh, speed limit requirements um, create these smaller sign zone areas. Location, no, that's a good one. That's an example of a very good location. Um, location 47, it's along 84th Avenue. And again, just due to the, the speed limit along this roadway, and the intersections and the clear zones that are required for pedestrian and traffic safety, um, they do generate smaller sign zone um, capability. And then lastly, uh, location 48, uh, again, it has a similar situation. So the overall map lo location, this document, will be presented as part of the land use bylaw amendment if in fact committee does decide today to uh, make any amendments to uh, the proposed bylaw amendment um, and will be included in the package that goes forward to council for consideration. Uh, because of the large sign locations and the um, ability for these locations to contain a large volume of election signs. Administration also does um, encourage committee to have a discussion about perhaps increasing the number of election signs um, per candidate, per location, as outlined in Schedule B, Section F, or consider striking that section altogether. And then the next, just for some further information, the next municipal election is scheduled to take place October 18th of next year. Nomination period is from January 1st until September 7th. And election signs will be uh, allowed to be placed from September 8th until October 18th. And with that, I am open to questions. Yeah, any question for Arlene? Okay. Yeah, Chairman Hunt? Yeah, go ahead. I can't miss you can see it. Arlene, sorry, I was just trying to I was just trying to find that schedule. Can you just speak to that last point about schedule B section F and, and a number of signs? I'm sorry, I'm not 
it, it's a longer part with all the maps I'm sort of furiously scrolling through to try to find it. So can you just sort of detail what that reference you made is? Sure. I think I can find it for you. Uh, I believe it was under Appendix B, Election Sign Locations. Um, right after the report, two pages after the, the initial ah. report before the maps. Yeah, got it. Thank you both. Thank Sorry, you. what's the page number on that, please? That is 92, yeah, okay. It is the second page after the end of the report, Councillor Friesen. Uh, page uh, 14 page. On, the on the overall report. Yeah. 14. Yeah. 14. Um, while we're all looking into it, I, uh, I just wanted to make a comment, Arlene. I don't have any questions. I wanted to thank you for the, the work and effort that you put into this. Um, I know that we're trying to make a simplified process. Uh, seeing all the maps uh, kind of made it look a lot more complicated and convoluted. I know that took a lot of work, so I really, really appreciate it. Um, uh, I really also uh, want to thank you for showing the overall big map because that gave a bit more perspective. Um, I don't have a vote on this committee, but uh, yeah, I, I was originally opposed to uh, having specific sign locations. I'm still on the fence, but uh, I think uh, what you put forward here is something palatable. Uh, I just question whether or not it's simpler, but uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Anybody else at uh, Kevin or two? Kevin? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Arlene, I have uh, one question for you. On the election sign locations, there is a section C there, or light item C. They need to be removed within seven days of the election. I was wondering if that was looked at to see if they could reduce that amount of time. So instead of seven days, uh, maybe make it 48 hours or two days. Was that ever contemplated in any of the discussions that you had? Uh, thank you, through the chair. Uh, the uh, seven-day requirement is uh, directly out of the Local Authorities Election Act. So this is just a, a compliance piece uh, uh, just to include it into this bylaw for ease of um, accessing information about election signs. And the seven days is established by the Local Authorities Election Act. Okay. Thank you very much for addressing that. Thank you. Thank you, Arlene, and thank you, Kevin. Uh, now, is anybody else? If there's no, can we have the motion, please? Wade, Wade. I just was hoping to jump in there if I could. Go ahead, Wade. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a question for administration on this one. Of the, I'm just wondering, um, would, there, would, there, would somebody that was, a, was doing or running for council, would they have to apply for sign permits uh, with this process now? Through the chair, this is uh, precisely uh, what this amendment is to support, is uh, not to have to go through a process where a permit needs to be applied for. Um, the overall in intention, um, administration is going to work with the GIS and the IT department. If in fact council does choose to pass this bylaw, we will make the overall land, the overall map, and the supporting maps um, app friendly and make sure that um, candidates can easily access uh, where the locations are and um, actually place their maps or their election signs um, th without any uh, requirement to check in with administration, without any requirement to uh, to require approval. Okay, um, which I appreciate that because I think the sign permit last time was a little cumbersome and I don't even know if it would apply. My, my concern with it though, with, without applying for a permit is where's our teeth on this? And, and one of the frustrations that I, that I think I had last time campaigning and heard from several people is, yeah, there's areas, there's things, but all of a sudden somebody put a sign where it shouldn't be and then you got four other people putting it. So I guess I'm wondering how this is gonna be policed. Um, that way, or who's looking after the signs once they're out, um, how they're going to be policed. Is, is, is bylaws literally just taking down signs because they put it up in the wrong location? Um, 
I guess the, the not having a signed permit, as good as it is, I think we've lost the opportunity to, for people that are about to run for council to understand process and educating them on process and undertaking why we're doing that. So can you just maybe let me know, Arlene, what's going to happen if uh, somebody applies or doesn't apply now, they start putting signs all over town wherever they, wherever they don't. So what, what would happen to those signs and what would happen to that potential candidate? So um, the previous practice of applying for a permit was not in fact endorsed by any bylaw of the city and as a result there wasn't any real um, countermeasures put in place for signs that were misplaced. Uh, the uh, current bylaw um, does require that a candidate place their signs in the sign zone and the they, any signs that are not placed appropriately are subject for remo removal. Um, that is um, the most that we could um, do uh, without um, having to start implementing fines. Okay. And just one other question, Chairman Osh, just so mm -hmm. Maybe just walk me through, so I choose to rerun for council, I come in, do I have to sign something that says I understood and I've adhered to these plans, or where's the checkpoint for people that are going to run for council to understand this is the rules? Because um, it was a little bit vague last time, so I'm just wondering if there's going to be a mechanism that when I apply and I put in my nomination form that I turn around and fill out these paperwork so I, I can't act like I don't understand what the process is, I guess, is one of my concerns with it. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, I am actually very excited about uh, election 2021 and being a big part of, of the, um, the event. And I've uh, tasked my team to um, update, modernize our candidate package. So after nomination papers are filed, the candidate packages, not only will they be available in paper copy if necessary, but we are modernizing everything and ensuring that the candidate packages will include a comprehensive set of map location, uh, election sign locations, as per the uh, use of public lands bylaw, and uh, as well as a number of other things that I feel that uh, candidates will, vet will take away and find value in. And uh, you will see a bit of a different process next year as to how you will have access to those tools and resources as a candidate. Um, there will be, I, I have a huge idea. Let's, let's just leave it there. <laughs> All right. Thanks for that, Mrs. Kovacic. Thanks, uh, Chairman Huss. Thank you very much, Wade, and thank you, Arlene. And uh, no question, so we need the motion. Dylan, Dylan. Sorry, can oh, I just make a comment? I'm going to miss you all the time. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Yeah, I just want to say thanks for bringing this back. I really appreciate it. And I think that it's great to hear that if council does endorse this, there's going to be a process that's easier for candidates to understand. I think it's really important that we're making the barriers to run very, very low in terms of figuring out the administrative backend stuff so candidates can spend more time getting to know the community and showing up at events and knocking on doors, not sitting in front of their computer trying to figure out GIS and what's public land and what's not public land. I also think that we could talk about, as we talk about accountability, it's great that we're going to have better processes for our bylaw to understand it. But even more important for me, candidates are accountable to the voters. And I know there are some voters who do pay attention where signs go and they evaluate candidates partly based on do they follow sign bylaws or not. And this would be a really easy way for voters themselves to look at a map, look at an app and say, Oh, great, that candidate's following the, following the rules. I respect that. That candidate's too lazy to even look at this easy map, so I can't respect that candidate. And I think that this is a good step towards not just making it easier to run, but also having more accountability for candidates to run. So I hope that committee will support this and the council will support this. Thank you, Dylan. So, anybody else have any question? No? Just let me see. So anybody's going to put the motion on? <laughs> Will, you're going to do it? I think Councillor O'Toole is ready to do it there, Councillor oh, Okay, Councillor O'Toole, go ahead. 
Thank you, Mayor, Bivin, Mayor Given. Uh, 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 Chair Minhas, I'd like to move the committee recommend council to give three readings to bylaw C 1078F, being an amendment to the public, the use of public lands bylaw. Thank you, Governor Tool, and the motion on the table. Any question on the motion? Let me check. Nobody's here. Nobody in the queue. All in favor? Thank you. Motion carried. Let's move on to the next one is 1.6. Uh, Wyla C1348, Records Management Bylaw. That's again, Arlene. You. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, once again, good morning, committee. Uh, I'm here today to request that committee recommend council give three readings to bylaw C-1348, being the records management bylaw, and repeal policy 114, being the destruction or preservation of municipal records. Currently, the City of Grand Prairie does not have a bylaw with regard to records management or uh, records management strategy. We do have policy 114, which was approved in 2011, that provides a high level and fairly generic guideline for the preservation or destruction of municipal records but it doesn't support current legislation requirements as set out in the MGA or the FOIP Act. So this proposed bylaw uh, actually sets out definitions of what are transitory records and what are official records. And it also identifies our responsibilities as a municipality regarding the protection of personal information that supports the legislative requirements of the FOIP Act. This bylaw also provides uh, the city manager with the authority to make decisions necessary for the management of all city records, as well as provides authority for the optional use, I'm really excited about this, the optional use of the designated software program DocuSign for the execution by signature of uh, city contracts, agreements, and other documents. And this, this is a requirement of the MGA under Section 213 for Council to pass such a bylaw to be able to, to, to do this. Yeah. So the, proposed, the purpose of the bylaw is also to establish a clear records management strategy. And through this bylaw, it will set the foundation for um, policy formation, managerial decision-making, uh, protecting the interests of the public, um, employees, uh, third parties. It will enable the city to meet legislative and regulatory requirements. And it will also support preserving the city's uh, corporate history. So with this document as our foundation, uh, by, uh, policies and procedures can be established for, uh, for instance, um, working with the South Peak Regional Archives and getting something in place where our, our historical records are being protected and stored accordingly. So with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Arlene. Any, uh, Kevin O'Toole, go ahead. Thank you very much, Ms. Karbahuski. I remember asking questions similar to some of the explanations that you gave way back uh, about eight or nine years ago when I was on the archives board wondering that the, the records were being destroyed and we never had anything in place. It was a conversation between two parties that decided what we were going to keep and what we weren't going to keep. So I'm really looking forward to this going through, and uh, now we've got a process that is in the books, you might say, possibly, and uh, it'll definitely benefit the, uh, the history and the documentation of the city. So looking forward to this. 
Thank you, Kevin Tool. Any other question? Uh, go ahead, uh, Mayor. Bill. Yeah, thanks, Councilor Rentas. Um, so just um, one small thing. Um, I wonder about uh, uh, DocuSign. I don't have a problem with the process or using digital signatures, um, but it's a, it's a trademark name brand. It's a little bit like saying Microsoft Office. Um, and so I wonder if maybe we want, and from time to time, administration may choose to replace that piece of software with a different piece of software. So I wonder if it'd be wise to, instead of defining DocuSign, um, the name brand, um, and referencing it in the document uh, under section four, I wonder if maybe there's a more generic term that we could use, like digital signature software, and just replace every reference to DocuSign with digital signature software. Um, that would allow administration the ability to change software without having to change the bylaw. Um, so uh, that would be one suggestion that I'd make if we wanted to have a motion uh, to, to make that amendment. Uh, I'd be happy to make that motion, but I just think it makes the, the bylaw a little bit more flexible uh, rather than basing our bylaw on one corporation's name brand software. Thank you, Mayor. And Erling, do you have, uh, Erling, do you have to say something or are you okay with it? Uh, through the chair, um, any amendments that this committee would like to make, uh, administration would be happy to support. And I, I do feel that that is a logical amendment to this bylaw. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So motion is on the table. Is there any discussion on the motion? I don't see it. If no, go ahead. Yeah, so, so just, just to confirm that, so I move. Ben, that uh, committee recommend council approve bylaw C1348 um, with the amendment of replacing references to DocuSign with digital signature software. Thank you very much. Updated. So, all in favor? Thank you. And the amendment is done. So, the next item is uh, 1.7. A seller 911 call answering fee increase. Councillor Minha. Yep. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we also need a motion about repealing policy 114. Oh, okay, sure. Go ahead, Kevin, go ahead. And I, I will make that. Uh, I move that uh, we repeal policy 114 being the destruction or preservation of municipal records. Any records? Thank you very much. So motion on, on the table, uh, any question on that motion? If it's not, all in favor? Carried, thank you very much. Sorry about that, missing that part. So now we move into the cellular 911 cell answering fee increase regulation. Three ban basin. To thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have to apologize, I do not believe I have video, but I trust you can hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to bri uh, address briefly the reason for this report and how it came about. At a monthly meeting of the Alberta Emergency 911 Advisory Association, uh, the increase of the cell phone levies were discussed, and it was recognized that an increase would be needed. As a long-standing member of the advisory association, our department was asked if we would be willing to take this forward to our council for their consideration. I agreed to take this on, on behalf of the group, and that is why I'm here today. I also know that there were some municipalities that got a bit ahead of us in the process, and some of their council members reached out to some of you before I was able to present this report today. And for that, I do apologize. The Grand Prairie Fire Department has been a big part of the 911 system since its implementation in the Grand Prairie area in 1994. We are currently the fifth largest call center based on population in the province of Alberta. We have had to upgrade much of our equipment over the years and will soon have to embark on the next generation 911 upgrade. As a municipality providing 911 services to our municipalities, it is very critical that the funding is in place to cover those costs. With the proposed 911 levy increase, 
that allow Grand Prairie Fire Department to continue to provide the 911 services that so many people have come to rely on. I therefore recommend that this committee move this report forward to council uh, with the suggested AUMA resolution. Thank you, and I'm certainly open to answer any questions that the committee may have, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mason. Uh, and uh, any question on this? Men, cellular phone uh, increased fees. Go ahead, Mayor. Yeah, just one for uh, Chief Boston. Um, Previn, uh, at this time, have you identified uh, who we might be asking to be a six, uh, seconder? Uh, that you know, it's a requirement that you may process. And I imagine you have other municipalities that are lined up to do that. And so, do you need a, a resolution or a motion from us to to ask those others? Uh, through the chair, um, Mr. Mayor Given, uh, I know Camrose uh, have offered to support the, the, the resolution and second it. I'm not 100% sure of the process, um, so I can certainly look into that and see if we do, do need to uh, contact them prior to the resolution going to a UMA. Thank you. And Wade, do you have a question? Thanks, Chair. I mean, I'm just curious on the capital on this, uh, Mr. Boston, just what's the, I mean, it's saying it's going to have a new in, in revenue, but is that revenue specific to just Grand Prairie or is that for 911 run region as a whole uh, for that $955,000? Is that for the city or would that be to 911 and then we get some of that allocation? Uh, to the chair. Um, so the revenue increase would go into a, a pool that would be divided up amongst the uh, PSAP center, so any 911 center, uh, of which Grand Prairie is one of. Uh, there are currently about 20 centers in the province of Alberta that uh, does uh, answer 911 calls. Um, so there's a formula based on, on population within the area that's served by that center. Uh, and that's how that money is uh, divided up. Um, that money does not go into sort of general uh, revenue coffers. It, it, uh, there are some restrictions on what it could be used for. Uh, so it has to be used in, in relation to operating the 911 center. Um, however, with this upgrade, uh, it will allow us to, to be competitive. Uh, and I am, uh, under the impression that there'll be some of the smaller centers that are not going ahead with this upgrade. So there will be some opportunity to pick some uh, additional business up uh, following this upgrade. And one of those areas would also be the Northeast corner of British Columbia, uh, being that currently we cannot do 911 calls across the provincial borders uh, with the next generation 911 they'll open up an area that has expressed interest coming uh, to the Grand Prairie 911 center, but technology currently does not allow that. Uh, so moving forward, I, I think there'll be some opportunity to increase the, the business that uh, comes through our center based on this upgrade. Okay, so just, I guess I can fully understand that. So the report's saying there's a cost of about 560,000, so that would, that would be Born by all of the all of the partners in the 911 program, the revenue would come up by 955. Am I, those are the numbers. That am, I, am I missing something on that? There, there would be about a $400,000 difference in what it would cost versus what would be brought into revenue for the 911 organization. Um, through the chair, uh, yes, there would be a, a difference. Um, now, there's uh, some capital costs to do an upgrade. There'll also be some ongoing maintenance fees. Of that, uh, of that equipment. Um, but with uh, this proposed tree uh, increase to the fees, um, we should be able to start building up our grant uh, funds again uh, in anticipation of future upgrades. So, so just, just one more question. So if I understand this, we put the upgrades in, this $955,000 annually would show up. Can you tell me what 2022 looks like then? If there's no cost upgrades, would that, in essence, all just be bottom line? We'd have extra money for this program, for the 911 program moving forward. And would that money 
speak the overall night oil organization, or would some of that might be specifically earmarked and would stay locally in Grand Prairie? So the the 911 center uh, is, is sort of funded through three different revenue streams, if you will. Um, so one is um, basically answering the 911 calls on landlines, um, and that was sort of where we initially got the funding to operate our 911 center to ensure that City of Grand Prairie doesn't pay for the 911 services for. Fairview, for instance. Uh, so there's a fair revenue source that, that offsets that, that cost to the municipality hosting the 911 center. Um, back when we started in 94, obviously the bulk of the calls would come in through the, the landline. Um, in addition to that, we would negotiate dispatching contracts with uh, fire departments in the areas where we answer the 911 call so we can sort of complete that, that call for help. And we, uh, we negotiate those contracts annually um, with the local municipality. Then of course, what happened was more and more calls started to come in on the cell phone uh, system and there were initially no revenue source identified with that. So a few years ago, they uh, created that 44 cent levy per cell phone user. Uh, so now we're looking at being a, probably between 75% and 80% of the 911 calls are coming on, on cell phones. Um, we're getting a bigger workload, but less money. So um, being that we're looking at, at increasing that revenue source to offset the cost, obviously. Um, so that money, again, it goes into um, a pool that the um, province then divvies up based on population base um, of the call centers. And then it goes into a grant fund account that we have set up. And then we can transfer that money out, um, but there are some specific guidelines on what we can use that transfer or use that, those funds for. So it has to be in relation to operating the center. I'm not sure if I so, totally answered your question. No, I think that, that definitely explains a little more because 911 has been a bit of a, I wasn't sure who actually owned the, owned the rights and who actually managed the rights, but I'm understanding that then locally the fire department um, would have some capital costs that would, that would come in and out, but we, we should look at a revenue increase to the local fire department from this, from the service. Am I understanding that right? Uh, that's correct. Okay. And, and when they were doing this, I guess, just, was there a, is this supposed to be a revenue stream or is it supposed to be a break even process? I'm just trying to understand with the 911 data services, is this something we're actually trying to make money on now? And, and I'm not saying opposed or for it. I'm just trying to curious because this looks like it will be a, a revenue stream moving forward once the capital costs are, are, are spent. Again, through, through the chair. Um, so, so as you know, any, any business that uh, wants to sustain itself needs to prepare for, uh, for upgrades and, and unforeseen costs. Um, so we have been, been uh, generating revenue and, and it sort of doesn't really show up as a revenue generating business, but it, the, the money builds up in a grant fund that we have sitting there. Um, but we have also tapped into that grant funding for some of the upgrades we are currently going through. And um, about a year and a half ago, we increased the staffing in that center and be using grant money for, for some of those positions as well. Um, so currently we are probably very close to a break even point. And in my view, that's, that's probably not, not where we need to be. We need to be able to build a bit of a margin because we know the equipment we put in today will have to be replaced five, seven, 10 years down the road. So we have to prepare for that through the grant funding. Uh, if we get this, uh, this increase through that, I think we'll be in a very good position to put some money away kind of to sustain the operation of the center. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Wayne, and thank you, Yuan. Is there any other question on uh, this, mo uh, this to P. Wayne? If not, can we get the motion, please? 
Eunice, go ahead, Eunice. Thank you. I'm just going to go back to it. So I would, uh, I'll, I'll make a motion here that committee recommend council endorse advocacy to increase 911 levy payable by cellular subscribers through the submission of uh, resolution to ADOMA. Thank you, Eunice. Is there any question on the motion? Doesn't look like it. Is that not all in favor? Motion carried unanimous. So now we're back to outstanding items. I think we need Shane Brook. Could you please? Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Haas. Um, both items uh, 1088 and 1041 uh, were presented today and uh, they're completed um, and uh, we recommend take them off the agenda. Uh, with regards to AUMA resolutions, um, we'll work with uh, Chief Boston to uh, put a package together for, for AUMA. Um, I don't, uh, at this point, uh, we have cameras interested in seconding, so we don't need any additional help uh, to, to find uh, uh, support. But if we, uh, if we do, we would be, uh, we'll come back to council and have you engage at uh, the appropriate uh, council elected official level. Uh, AUMA process has changed a little bit this year and uh, we'll make sure that we uh, comply with all the AUMA uh, timelines. Thank you. Shane Book, is, uh, we need the motion to update. Any question? None. Eunice, go ahead. Um, sure, I will uh, um, move to accept the outstanding items list as amended. Thank you. Motion on the table. All in favor? Motion carry. With that, I think the cooperative service committee agenda is over and now is with, I think your turn. Thank you very much for everybody. Uh, thanks, Councilor Mayhouse. So we'll switch gears to the protective and social services committee agenda. And uh, if we have Director Emmanuel on the phone, we'll start with, with uh, his update, please. On the call. Good morning. So community social development uh, hosted a virtual coffee on May 28th with 50 people in attendance. And uh, there was a request from the community to have CSD partner with Alberta Health Services to deliver some free training. So psychological first aid for the pandemic will be hosted June 17th. And uh, transform stress will be hosted on June 19th. Um, additionally, last week, Council... Uh, passed a bylaw that uh, made some changes with Youth Council. So we will be looking to do a formal call out for applicants and recruitment for the Youth Council in the coming weeks. Um, additionally, an agreement has been signed for four affordable housing units in Smith subdivision. Uh, these we managed through a local property management company and available to the Housing First program. Um, uh, additionally, Additionally, uh, the Community Advisory Board on Housing and Homelessness, I guess on homelessness, um, did a call out for landlords for affordable rental units. So that uh, press release went out, I believe, uh, early last week or the week before. And uh, they're soliciting more inventory for Housing First. And the Integrated Co Coordinated Access Phase 2 RFP is uh, going out and uh, that will provide a financial inventory of resources available in the community, um, essentially different programs that are funded uh, at all different levels of government and privately and let us better understand where the money is being spent and uh, perhaps where some efficiencies uh, can be identified. In enforcement services, his officers are gonna be focusing on commercial vehicle safety unsecure loads and uh, recreational vehicle parking complaints in residential areas. Uh, they also note that calls for service are increasing as the weather's getting better and um, patrols are focused on hotspots and community safety. Uh, G-Prep continues to uh, provide response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as well as an all hazards approach to other emerging 
concerns such as wildfires and uh, floods and those sorts of things in the area. Uh, they are looking to transition to a more sustained model, moving away from what was the initial response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So some more information will follow on that next week. The fire department continues to complete training assignments and work on equipment maintenance and testing. Uh, as many of you have probably observed during the pandemic uh, closures, they were participating in a number of the birthday drive-bys upon request and uh, received positive feedback from the community regarding that. And that's uh, we winding up here shortly as uh, more and more businesses return to normal. And the RCMP have submitted a relaunch reopening plan to national headquarters and they're just awaiting approval before the detachment uh, reopens in a more robust state than it's at right now. Uh, the RCMP still have a three-tiered response due to COVID-19, which involves a road response team, triage team, and a strategic reserve. So that's the updates from TSS. Thanks for that, Director Manuel. Uh, so we'll take some questions. I see uh, we'll go Councillor O'Toole and then Councillor Breslin, please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pallott. Uh, Chris, I just had a question on your birthday drive-bys and stuff like that. I had a couple of calls in the last two weeks uh, regarding uh, the groups getting together, doing everything. It's all enjoyable. And then there's a bunch of people that will stage and they'll go into a parking lot and they'll do break stands or donuts or something like that. And it's for this one situation up there by the French school, there's a church parking lot there and you can look by and there's nothing but rubber all over the place. Uh, some people felt that it was real cool and other felt that it was a, a possible danger. My question is, are the bylaw enforcement uh, in, in, uh, engaged in any of this? Are they, in, in, are they acknowledged that this parade is gonna take and what process does the city have with that? Like to me, if someone's breaking the law, they're breaking the law, and if they're not, then they're not. And uh, the concern was that somebody could easily lose control on a motorcycle and come across the street and hit someone. Uh, this doesn't happen very often, but I just wanted to know if they have to get a permit possibly or engage in the conversation saying that we're gonna do this. What is the process so we can continue on having this little birthday party celebration with having a parade? Uh, to answer the question, to date, uh, enforcement absolutely hasn't been involved. Uh, these have kind of been community-led initiatives that involve no permitting processes. And uh, you, you're absolutely right. You certainly, there's been some report of uh, people exhibiting behaviors that uh, they wouldn't ordinarily be allowed to get away with. I suspect sure. that as things transition over the, uh, the coming days and weeks here, uh, this is coming to an end. And I suspect if bylaw came across that parking lot where people were doing brake stands and whatnot with their cars, that uh, they would uh, likely be subject to some enforcement. So, you know, we'll, we'll relay that message to the people that are involved in this. They had their, their opportunity to uh, fill some voids that may have existed in the community around connectedness, but I think that time has come to an end now. Thank you very much for that explanation. Councillor okay. Brassi. Great, thank you, Chair Plot. And I've got two questions. Uh, one is just regarding, it's great to hear that recruitment's gonna be underway soon for the Youth Council. I'm wondering if there's any thought yet to when recruitment might start for the Police Advisory Committee. Uh, Arlene and I had a preliminary kind of email discussion about that uh, the other day. We hadn't, um, uh, as I recall, I don't believe we landed on a specific date yet, but uh, certainly if there's desire to move that ahead sooner than later, we can do that. Yeah, uh, I've just got people in the community asking, so I don't really have too much of an agenda if it happens in a couple weeks or a couple months, but just as you know, it would be nice to just get an idea of timelines as you know them, just because I've got people that are interested in asking, hey, when should I pay attention to this? Um, 
Then my other question is something that something that I've definitely advocated for in the past is for us to use more speed signs that give people a real time update of if they're speeding or not. And I and some people in the community know I've advocated for that, and they've brought to my attention that we're currently selling one of those units that we own that allows for that. And I've had a lot of concern in the community about why are we getting rid of a unit like that instead of getting more of those units. So I'm wondering if you could just give me some context on why that's why we're divesting ourselves of that asset. Uh, certainly. So uh, I wasn't previously aware that there was a such an item on job deals, but there is, but uh, I am familiar with it. So essentially the city enforcement has had a radar display trailer for probably around 15 years. Uh, we certainly, we deployed this regularly. It was also used in conjunction with when we had those pick signs down in the Swan Avon school zone that uh, used to identify speed as well. Uh, over the years that it was deployed, both the speed sign and those fixed signs, we found they had no actual impact on reducing speed violations within those zones. I think it just reminded the people that were abiding by the law that they're abiding by the law and those that weren't uh, didn't really pay too much attention to them. But that being said, I would say the useful life of this particular sign uh, piece of equipment has expired. There are certainly options out there that exist today that are more, much more multifunctional, where you know they'll track traffic volumes, they'll um, get you a lot better analytical data this, than this piece of equipment would today. Uh, additionally, it takes about two hours to actually deploy this sign on a daily basis. It's an, an hour-long setup process and an hour-long return at the end of the day process. So you're taking two hours of a officer's time just deploying the sign. So that's one of the reasons why that combined with its ineffectiveness um, or the reasons why the city moved away from it. Uh, when Global started their contract five years ago, the first two years of their contract, they actually deployed the sign for us. But again, the conversation came down to it wasn't really achieving the desired benefits. I think that there's uh, better approaches that can be undertaken. And those I would actually recommend that any traffic calming measures, such as speed signs, uh, fall under the direction and control of our traffic engineering department because they're the ones that went to school and have the expertise on, on what measures have been proven to be most effective. Enforcement uh, is good at identifying the black and white as far as uh, you're violating, you're not violating, and, and here's, your, um, here's the result of that. But uh, when it comes to the actual uh, technology and what's been proven to work well, uh, traffic engineering be the place to go. Great. Thank you. I appreciate the answer. Uh, any other questions for Director Manuel? Uh, Councilor Thiessen? Uh, thank you very much, Chair Platt. Uh, thanks, uh, Director Manuel, for the update. Uh, just a question on the uh, affordable housing units in Smith. Uh, you said they were permanent supportive housing, or is that where they're earmarked, or, um, or is there a potential that they would turn into either family homes or group homes? Uh, sorry, no, my, uh, I must have miscommunicated that. Uh, so these, my understanding is it's a fourplex. Okay. Um, I believe it's targeted more for families and it's Perfect. a private investor that used, um, one of the government programs that's available to help develop affordable housing. And he has committed those units to the housing first program and essentially offers a 20% below market rate for rent. Great, that's a, that's a good news story. Um, thanks for that. Uh, actually, I was gonna ask you uh, if they're spaced out, but a fourplex sounds pretty, pretty self-contained in itself. Um, I guess my other question that I have for you is just in regards to how the early transition of our temporary shelter uh, people are, is going uh, from Dave Barr to the Bose Center and uh, how their relationship is working out with the businesses in the area that were a bit put off by it. Well, the, the move happened yesterday. Um, okay. An early indication would be my phone hasn't rang this morning, but um, there's going to be some additional work required there just to connect with the, the impacted businesses if there is any impact. 
certainly the impact at Dave Bar itself have been fairly quiet uh, over the course of the, the two months that it was running there. So um, the transition with the residents has uh, been good. They That went well. The move yesterday went well. And uh, certainly enforcement in the RCMP and some of our other partners are uh, are making a presence known downtown. And and uh, the staffing and connections are still the same as what we had with Dave Bar. It's the we basically just uprooted Dave Bar and, and relocated. So it's uh, same processes, same people, uh, a lot of continuity. Awesome, thanks. Uh, just just while we're on that, uh, Director Manuel, can you give me kind of an update? Uh, we're kind of getting back into where tent season usually kind of pops up because it becomes a little more attractive for some of our vulnerable population. Can you give me kind of an idea of what, what we currently have for uh, occupancy at Rotary House and formerly Dave Bar, which will be converted over to Revolution Place, but just kind of how many uh, vulnerable people are still using this service and are we, are we full? Tell you what, um, if I get a break, I, I can circulate that number to you guys. Uh, I'd be guessing off the top of my head right now. There's there is capacity. Is there is not anybody that would get turned away and not have a place to stay. Um, a person's desire to stay in the tent is their desire not to be associated with either the program or other people or or whatnot. So. I know as of this morning, all the existing tents that were standing are no longer standing. Later today, I'm sure a few of them are going to pop up and we'll repeat the process tomorrow. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, so seeing no other questions and no other other business, um, I guess we can just move into our outstanding items. Let's please. Okay. So um, the, the first item we have on there, which is the vehicle for hire again, status remains, um, you know, COVID affected our, our community consultation. So we're looking to return early fall with that. And uh, then when it comes to traffic enforcement efficiency, uh, the next community, or sorry, getting all my committees mixed up here from the past, but uh, our next PSS committee meeting, we'll have a report for us for that. That's it. All right, uh, Councillor Thiessen. Yeah, I would move to uh, approve the outstanding items list. Okay. As, so, as presented. As presented, okay. Uh, all those in favor? Or Councillor Council Tula, do you have a comment or are we just voting? No, okay. I'm... All right, so it looks like we're unanimous in favor of uh, that. And then it would be looking for a motion from committee to go in camera, please. Councillor Thiessen again. So moved, Chair Palat. Okay, all in favor? All right, so we will uh, end this I, uh, Protectors and Social Committee agenda. Thanks for your updates, uh, Director Manuel, and we will proceed to go in camera. Just so I understand, is it on the same feed, or are we all logging back in on our different feed? Uh, log out, uh, log back? Log out, uh, Arlene has sent a new link for the next meeting. Great, thank you. Goodbye.